island are you on there, Scott? Cumbria. Alan is here. The Alan, oh, the Isle of Man. Oh once again. Good morning, Alan. Hello. <laughs> nice to have you. Hi. Is it only people from islands that are allowed to join today? No, no, no. We'll let anyone in. I got North Carolina here. So did you <laughs> did you get my message about Douglas being the capital? I did. I did see that, yes. That's funny. Morning, Cameron. Must be the middle of the night for Cameron. Yeah. Where is he? Uh, Hong Kong way. Oh, really? Oh, that's yeah. outstanding. Okay. 10 o'clock, 10 p.m. I've just been listening to Teddy Kalau, uh, uh, Gordon, who was telling everybody they should tune in on Tuesday night. Oh, fantastic. <coughs> He's getting up very early for me. 2 a.m. Yeah. Wonderful. Right. I have one of those coming up soon as well. I have a, a presentation I'm giving in a couple of weeks' time. That will be they will have me up at two AM to, to start, I think. It's not even that's that's the start time. That's dedication. Yeah. <laughs> that's why I listened to Gordon. And then the same with the uh, Grand uh, Sapere Audi ones, the neat uh, the replay the following day. Yeah, it's handy doing it on the YouTube for everyone. Right. Yeah. But since it's about the Philippines, I'd better turn in and live and. Uh, <laughs> Brother Rintoul, where do you hail from? You're on mute. You're on mute, David. <laughs> He's still working right up. Morning, good Neil. Morning. Good morning, Christopher. How are you today? I'm good. I'm good. Trying to see the crowd shuffling. Brother Rintoul, where do you hail from? Yeah, okay. I'm a past master of Lord Buck and St. John. Okay. In, in Scotland, and I'm also the current Master of Lodge Pioneer 1305, which is a lodge of research here in Scotland. Excellent. Hi, Gordon. Hi, David. <laughs> and Brother Alan, where are you from, sir? You're on mute. <laughs> You're on mute, Alan. No, not anymore. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm currently in Honeybourne in oh Worcester. okay hey I'm sorry I should be more specific brother Alan with an iPad how are you doing I'm doing good <laughs> okay thank you I'm and, the right uh, master of Lodge Buck in St John 66 Scotland in Lanlithgowshire province okay oh you would you be brother Lockhart then no, brother Alan Dillett. Oh, okay. You're not on my list. Okay. All right. I'm trying to, I'm going off my list of people I asked to speak. And so, uh, brother Dale, hello there. Hi, hi. Hey. <laughs> so, the, <laughs> well, this will accomplish my purpose, but it appears that almost the entire, uh, the entire audience is Scottish. So plenty so of people ask questions. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. I'm used to the Brits and the Canadians taking over. So this week it's the Scots. That's been most interesting. Well, I live about a mile in England, so I'm, I'm English. Right. Okay. But, but I'm, I'm, I'm currently living in Ireland, so. Right. Oh, hello. Hello. You can always tell with Brother Dawson's here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. International Masonic Times. Indeed. All right, then. Well, we're coming up on 10. Um, 
So, hey, Neil, do you happen to know what uh, what's going on with Brian? If there's a reason he's not here, because normally he's always here. No, no, I, I think I've I've seen her in the chat group this morning already. Okay, interesting. Okay. Morning, afternoon, brethren, wherever you are. Well, as I was saying earlier, and I appreciate everybody coming out. Um, even if I have nothing but a panel and only one or two. Uh, audience members. This will be going out on YouTube, so people will be able to, uh, to watch it and get the answers later. But my hope was to have a good audience of uh, a good mix of people. But I do appear to have a lot of scouts coming at me. <laughs> so that's something quite interesting. But that's good. Between you all, you'll be able to answer all the questions. So this should be a lot of fun. I'd rather have more people on the panel than less. Um, so I'm still waiting. It's 10 o'clock. We're going to give people a few more minutes to come in. My co-host is not here yet, so i got to be driving. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone. My name is Chris Douglas. I'm a past master of Ocean View Lodge, number 335 in Norfolk, Virginia. And there's my co-host, my lovely co-host now. Um, good to see you, Brian. And uh, this is being hosted by uh, Virginia Research Lodge. Number 1777, meaning out of Highland Springs, Virginia. How you been, Brian? Oh, Hello, good you. afternoon. <laughs> Apologies, got caught up by the time zone difference. That's quite right. Yes. No, but I not retirement. <laughs> All right, now we got more people coming in. Uh, so I'll go ahead and explain as more people are settling in. Um, this is a what we call the weekly unstated meeting for Virginia Research Lodge since because of COVID, we couldn't have stated meetings. I came up with the term of having unstated meetings online. This is the normal time we would meet about four times a year is Saturday at 10 o'clock uh, Virginia time. Uh, with me, my other co-host is, um, point this way, Ham Solo. That's my pig laying in the frame. I turned off my filter because if I have the filter on, you can actually still see him, which I thought was hilarious. If you see, I normally have this filter off but he's still in the frame. So it looks like he's in lodge with me. <laughs> so I just went ahead and left my background. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so we have um, typically for our research lodge uh, unstated, we have um, a guest speaker come in and um, I try to have a variety of things since this is a new media, I'm trying to discover different things that work and don't work. Uh, I try to have these panel discussions I've already had them with uh, Brazilians and Filipinos so far, and this week it's Scotland. So the idea is I bring in several brethren from that Grand Lodge just to speak on what masonry is like in their Grand Lodge and what they consider perfectly normal and you know what masonry is, and then contrast it to, say, Virginia masonry, what I think is pretty typical of American masonry for the most part. Um, but that's the whole idea is to kind of show just pick a different country about once a month and have you all come in and we kind of go back and forth and ask very routine questions. There's some I'll, I'll ask, so hopefully you'll all be able to answer. Ah, Brother Clark, good to have you here. Um, and uh, the idea is to get more of a feeling of what you all would consider perfectly normal and average. And if you haven't really been outside of Scotland, then you'd say, well, this is what masonry is. Um, but it's a lot of fun because there are so many differences, a lot of similarities but there are enough differences and it's really kind of fun to explore that and kind of point out to a lot of Masons who uh, are kind of insulated and only know what their local lodge does and what their local district does. They really don't know how Masonry can vary so much throughout the world. And that's the whole intent is to show the differences in Masonry. We're all still Masons, but it's really kind of cool to check out what, uh, how we do things just a little bit differently everywhere we are. So that's the point of these. Um, we also have uh, just round robin meetings where I just ask questions to everybody in the audience and so on. So I'm trying different mediums instead of just having a guest speaker. As interesting as it is to get a research paper presented by one man, um, I kind of like try to do things a little different just because we have the medium available and see what works for people. So we're kind of new at this and I'm just kind of making up as I go along, but uh, it's a lot of fun and people do seem to enjoy it. So uh, Brother Joyner is getting ready to join. I think we're going to go ahead and uh, at least start saying hello to everybody. Um, I'm just going to go uh, around the room and ask all of our panel members. Um, so let's see. Let me get set up here. 
Um, okay. Uh, Gordon Mitchie we have here. Uh, what uh, what's lodge are you from, sir? Good morning, good afternoon, Chris. Um, my mother lodge is Lodge Errol Haig, number 1260, in the province of Fife and Kinross, uh, within the beautiful uh, Kingdom of Fife on the east coast of Scotland, just north of Edinburgh. Uh, we like to, to think that we're actually the cradle of Freemasonry in the province, uh, because William Shaw is buried within Dunfermline Abbey, and I can see the rest of um, my colleagues from elsewhere uh, having a wry smile about that, but uh, we can't claim the, the antiquity of Kilwinning or Mary's Chapel, but we do have William Shaw uh, at rest with us. I'm also currently the Right Worshipful Master of the Lodge Hope of Karachi, uh, our province's research lodge, and during the pandemic, we've brought to the world uh, our lockdown lecture series, which has just uh, went through our 55th meeting, and uh, we celebrated our first anniversary last week. Uh, I'm also in a variety of other orders uh, that you would expect in Scotland that we'll probably touch on later on today. Excellent. Okay. Uh, Brother Watson, what uh, lodge are you from? Good brethren, and uh, good morning to the brethren from across the across the way. Uh, my mother lodge is Lodge Kelburn, number four five nine, which is a, an island lodge. We're part of uh, Argyle and the Isles province, and we're over on the west coast of Scotland, towards uh, sort of past Glasgow, and towards the the sort of Atlantic um, that sort of side for for those that are interested. Uh, we're the smallest island uh, in terms of geographic size to have a working lodge in Scotland. And despite being such a small community, um, we are very fortunate that we have a lot of younger members coming through and into, uh, into the craft. Um, and we're in a very fortunate position in, in that respect. Uh, my own background, I'm currently the Worshipful Senior Warden. And I am very keen on Masonic research of, of all kinds. I recently wrote a piece on William Shaw, which uh, Brother Mitchie mentioned just recently. And uh, I also run my own newsletter on Masonic Art, um, which I'll be happy to share details of later on. Yes, yes please, um, if you want to put anything in the chat, you are more than welcome to. Um, I'm going to go ahead and put in our um, <clears throat> information. If you're not a member of our Facebook group, you're more than welcome. I'm putting up a link to our Facebook group, our lodge website, and my email. We do a weekly um, research paper email that I send out to uh, members of our email group, as well as we post on the um, Facebook page. So you are more than welcome to uh, sign up for that if you like, but you can just get them from the Facebook page if you want. That's fine. Uh, Brother Harpold is from North Carolina. Good to have you here. Brother Buck is from the Isle of Man. Brother Sloan, are you a member of a Scottish Lodge then? And you're in... I'm, uh, no, I'm actually now in the Philippines. Okay. I'm, uh, my, my, mother, my mother Lodge is Lodge uh, St. John 618 in Hong Kong, which okay. was a Scottish Constitution Lodge. I'm a past master of that. Also a past master of uh, Lodge Cosmopolitan, which is okay. the oldest Scottish Lodge in the Far East. It was originally in China. Uh, and is a now a research lodge in Hong Kong. And I retired to the Philippines and joined the only Scottish lodge in the Philippines. Very good. Okay. Uh, older, than, older than the Grand Lodge of the Philippines. All right. Uh, Brother Gavin Richardson, please introduce yourself. Good morning, good afternoon all. Uh, my mother lodge is uh, Karen 139 in the province of Stirlingshire. So just next door to both uh, Linlithgow and Fife, as we had mentioned there. Uh, currently, I'm residing in Ireland, and I've uh, affiliated there to uh, an Irish constitution as well, the Hibernian 95, uh, involved in some various other uh, lodges and orders as well. Uh, keen interest in research, uh, number 200 in the Irish constitution, 276 in the English, etc. Uh, so, yes, uh, very keen to see what we can pick up today. Excellent. Good to have you here. Uh, Brother Rintoul, I know I introduced you earlier. I'm sorry. Are you uh, Scottish or English or what is your... <laughs> sorry. I know I introduced earlier, but it went out my mind. 
That's a very loaded question if you okay. ask a Scotsman. Well, yes, if he's okay. Scottish or English. Well, <laughs> I'm I'm definitely Scottish. Okay, very good. And is it Rintoul? Am I butchering that, or is that correct? No, that's correct. That's okay, correct. Very good. Okay, uh, brother Alan Keegan. Nice to have you here. Please introduce yourself. Hi there. Uh, I'm uh, was senior deacon at. Uh, Logs, uh, which is 173 St. John Kilwinning Logs on the uh, Riviera of uh, Scotland on the, the West Coast. Um, but I've recently moved down to England, and so I'm uh, working on joining um, Lodge Avon in nearby Evesham. So that'll be a nice transition for me to see what, uh, what the differences are. Excellent. All right. Uh, let's see. Brother Neil is from Canada. Brother Alan with the iPad. Can I get you to introduce yourself? Get your last name, please. Uh, brother Alan Dillett. I'm the Right Worshipful Master of Lodge Buck in St. John, 66, in the province of Lanlithgenshire in Scotland. Uh, I've been the master now for, this will be my second term, this, because of the pandemic. Uh, our lodge has just kept the office bearers ongoing. And I'm on here today mm. to give a bit of support to our immediate past master, Brother Kevin Taggart, who I think is doing a wee talk later on. So that's that. So I'm looking forward to hearing immediate past master, Brother Kevin Taggart. <laughs> All right. Al, what, I'm sorry, your last name again? Dillett, D-I-L-L-E-T. D-I-L-L-E-T, Dillett. Dillett, okay. Yeah. Okay, nice to have you here. Uh, Brother Kevin, please introduce yourself. Kevin, uh, Kevin 636, please introduce yourself. Good morning, afternoon, Brelan. Uh, I must be getting watched today. I have actually two right worshipful masters. I'm the immediate past master of Lodge Buck in St. John number 636, which uh, my right worshipful masters keep an eye on me. I'm also a master mason of Lodge Pioneer 1305 Research Lodge, which Brother David Rintoul is a right worshipful master at the moment. So I better mm -hmm. watch my P's and Q's before I get around. Uh, Buck and St. John is in the province of Northcushire. We're about 10 minutes from Edinburgh Airport. We're close to Brother Gordon, um, Stirlingshire. We're really central belt in Scotland. Um, we're only 10 minutes from 10, 15 minutes from the city of Edinburgh. So we're fortunate enough we can visit a lot of provinces around about us. And that's um, one of the great things. Our province is probably from one lodge to the other. The furthest distance is probably about 25 minutes driving. We have 19 lodges in our province, so it's quite tight. Yeah. And we get a lot of interaction with the brethren. And uh, Brother Christopher, thanks very much for the invitation today. All right. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Brother Brian is my Ed McMahon. Uh, <laughs> Brother Robert Clark, please introduce yourself. And you're a regular attendee here. It's nice to see you again. My brother Chris. Uh, yeah, my name is Robert Clark. I'm uh, my mother lodge is Port Lodge 226. I'm a past master of St Margaret's Hope 1184, and I'm at the moment the immediate past master of the Lodge Hope of Karachi uh, 337 in Fife. Uh, St Margaret's Hope's in Fife and in, in Rosyth, and so is Lodge Hope of Karachi. Uh, but Portobello is on the sunny seaside of Edinburgh. Good to have you here. Uh, Brother Richardson, please introduce yourself. And you don't look like a Fiona. <laughs> Need to unmute. Uh, still need to unmute. <laughs> Is that better? Yes. Hi. Well, good afternoon or good morning, wherever you all are. Uh, my name is Walter Richardson, uh, father of Gavin, who was uh, speaking with you earlier. And uh, I'm a past master of the uh, Lodge Car number 139, Scottish Constitution. And uh, at present just retired, uh, being uh, one of these past masters who sit at the back and say, they didn't do it like that in my day. <laughs> ah, yes. A man after my own heart. Good to have you here, brother. All Thank right. Uh, brother Jordan. Is, or sorry, Brother Joyner is from uh, Richmond. Nice to have you here, Brother. He's also a member of uh, Research Lodge. And um, Brother Dale Hall, I'm sorry. I, I know I asked you earlier, but I'm going to ask you again. And you're from England, correct? And you're muted. 
You're muted, Dale. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, uh, I am from England, but it's right on the border, a little town called Berwick upon Tweed. I can I can okay. see Scotland from my house, so okay. uh, <laughs> it's quite a an ideal place to be based, to be honest, because there's a lot of English lodges and English orders around where I live, and of course there's a lot of Scottish ones ten minutes up the road. So it's a quite a good place to be based to get a, a big difference of things. Uh, Masonically, I'm a past master of Lodge Friendship, number 1712, and they meet in central Edinburgh. I'm currently the director of ceremonies, and I'm a member of two lodges in the Scottish borders, Lodge Duns 2-3, which I'm immediate past master, and I am junior deacon, I think, of Lodge Witter 1245. Uh, Both these lodges were, were supposed to amalgamate with each other last year but that got put on hold because of the pandemic but uh, hopefully soon that the two lodges will be as one uh, once we get back to to meeting again whenever that may be so you you belong to both scottish and english lodges or you attend both scottish and english lodges well i belong to both uh, i belong to an english lodge as well but okay. i belong to english lodges and scottish lodges and other orders but primarily Scotland, everything, most things I do in Scotland, okay. England, more for pleasure. Okay. Uh, Brother Alan Lockhart and Kevin Troy are not here, but they were on my list. Hope they could attend, but I think we're we're doing okay. We have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I have t- 11 people I can count as being on the panel, so this should be quite interesting. Brother Ade, as you can guess, is Canadian. Good to have you here, Brother Ade. You want to go and say hello and introduce yourself before we move on? Need to unmute. Yeah, good morning, good um, afternoon, wherever you are. Um, I'm a member of uh, Westgate 734, uh, Lodge in uh, Toronto, Ontario. I'm um, also past master of uh, Lewis Lodge, um, 8775, uh, six, uh, which is a part of uh, United Grand Lodge of England in the district of uh, Ghana. Good to have you here. And Brother Knox, would you like to say hello before we start? Good morning. Nice to have you here, brother. Okay, so I think we have enough. I definitely think we have a quorum. Um, I'm going to set myself up so I can see my questions. Oops. Boop, boop, boop. Close that. All right. I'm sure I can read. There we go. Okay, we'll see how this goes. So um, I will ask you to uh, try to kind of keep your question short. I mean, I, I know that we can tend to go on, but I do want to cover a lot of things. Certainly, if you want to elaborate a bit on the answer, go ahead. But I am going to ask a lot of different questions, and uh, I will probably ask your questions. So please just answer the question I ask you because. Don't say, oh, and while we're talking about that, let me blah, blah, blah. Because I, I, I did try to guess, try to anticipate all the different topics I want to cover here. We should be able to cover them. Uh, but of course, if you don't know, if any brother, like if I ask, like, what year was your Grand Lodge founded or something, if you don't know offhand, I don't mind a brother jumping in with, uh, with the answer. That's perfectly fine. But I do want to make sure uh, everyone gets a chance to answer questions. And we'll just, we'll just go around, Robin, we'll see how we go here. Uh, so we'll start. With, and I will try to keep your name straight as I go. I can use first names for the most part, um, but I'll, I'll try and keep it straight. If I call on you the wrong way or whatever, please don't get offended, but it should be a lot of fun. So uh, again, now that everyone's here, uh, again, this is being hosted by Virginia Research Lodge, number 1777, based out of Highland Springs, Virginia. I'm Chris Douglas, and I'm your host. Thank you all very much for attending. Let's start with Brother Gordon. Um, how many lodges in the Grand Lodge of Scotland? Oh, I should have had my yearbook to hand, which I do. I think uh, we've got about six, over 600, 632 in okay. Scotland uh, and around about 300 or so active overseas. Uh, but I can uh, have a, a quick squint and give you the exact number that's, that's, that's uh, during this fine. meeting. That's I, but just under a thousand active across the Scottish Constitution, Chris. Okay. 
Uh, Brother Scott, is the Grand Master elected every year? Or how, how long does he serve? Can he be elected multiple years and so on? How does that work? I didn't realize we had to study for this, Brother Christopher. This, this uh, should be that. common knowledge. <laughs> if I know, know it off the top of my head, you should too. <laughs> um, I, I actually don't know. <laughs> I feel, I feel right. ashamed here. Um, I'm, I should possibly say that okay. I'm probably one of the, uh, the newer <laughs> members of the craft looking oh, around the screen here, so there might be. Don't feel bad. All right, so uh, we, will, we will ask the audience, uh, any of those who want to chime in, when, how often is the Grandmaster of Scotland elected? Every or year. Or is he elected? Every year, Annu annually. Okay, and, and he is, typically advances then. Just, just to expand on that, if you don't mind, from my own knowledge, um, yes. is that a sort of, um, obviously with the provincial Grandmasters, it's expected that, they do a certain amount of time. Is it the same with the Grand Master? Is he expected to do a certain amount of time? So it's almost a formality that he's being elected every year? Yes, he's normally expected to do about five years, same as a, a provincial or district Grand Master who's commissioned us for five years. Uh, yeah, Brother Cameron, can you go and ex expand on that? What is, a what is a provisional Grand Lodge? Because we do not have them. Can you explain that? Provincial, provincial or district. Sorry. Okay, and how and, many? Uh, they, and their district, their district grand, their, their your equivalent would be a, a deputy district grandmaster. Oh, okay. Would and ours would be either a provincial grandmaster or a, a, a district grandmaster. Okay. Provinces in Scotland, districts overseas. Okay, um, brother Gavin, um, how many officers in the Blue Lodge? Uh, I think we're very fortunate in Karen that we've got a, a plethora. Uh, we have uh, very fortunate myself to be the, the piper in the lodge, and that's unique to the Scottish Constitution. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not an office that's anywhere else in, uh, in Freemasonry. Uh, we have a number of brethren, junior brethren, who go through the uh, sword bearer, Bible bearer, architect, jeweler, all the way through the chairs, all the way up to Worshipful Junior Warden, Worshipful Senior Warden, and then on to the Master's Chair. Then, of course, there's the Past Masters, uh, Reigning Masters, etc. So I know in Karen, I think we've got 19 different office bearers. And I oh, think uh, that's the progression then is, is quite slow and it's methodical and it's routine and there's no skipping ahead. OK, which which one is, which of those are elected, which are appointed? I mean, you say numbers, you don't have to list each one, but all elected. Everybody is elected every year. There's an all annual election of office bearers every year. All 19 okay. are elected. With the exception of the immediate past master, everybody is elected. Wow. Okay. But, but logic, the, ta the tailor. Lodges have the option to, uh, or the master has the option to nominate his deputy and substitute. Yes. Okay. That's the only They can be either be elected or nominated. Okay. By yeah. comparison, uh, Virginia, which I like to say, and I'll be corrected at some point, but I like to say Virginia is pretty typical of American Grand Lodges, but they may vary more as they get out further west. But most of our, most of our Grand Lodges evolved from the colonies and the, the Grand Lodges that were on the East Coast at the founding. And we all sprung up, of course, shortly after the revolution. Um, but most of them come from us, so they're not too far removed. Like California, I think, can trace itself right back to Pennsylvania. So it's not like there were several iterations as it moved west. It's pretty much a handful of Grand Lodges chartered almost all of the Grand Lodges that went out west. So we're very close. And um, so the similarities, are, I think, are very consistent across the country, as large as it is. Um, but uh, in Virginia, you have seven elected officers the worshipful master, junior and senior warden, treasurer, secretary, junior, senior deacon. And then everybody else is appointed. Marshal, chaplain, tyler, stewards, organist, if you have one, are all appointed. Um, so the junior deacon can come up off the floor, as it were. So that's interesting. Okay, so all 19 are elected, and it's a progressive line. That's a lot of commitment. You know you're going to have you know, to be master for almost 20 years. And just to add to that as well, Go ahead. most of the brethren here are from a Scottish lodge, so they're well aware of this, but more for the, the recording. Yes. 
that's not consistent across all of Scotland. Um, one of the big things about Scottish Freemasonry is that each lodge has its own ritual. It has its own uh, way of doing things. It has its own office bearers. So it's not always the same lodge to lodge. Oh, really? one, lodge may, one lodge may have a piper. Another lodge, I know for ourselves, we have both a piper and an organist. Um, okay. So that it, it can vary depending on where in Scotland you're. Absolutely. Just to take up on that, uh, mm -hmm. within the province of Stirlingshire that, uh, that Karen is in, there's only two pipers in that, and the other piper is actually the Worshipful Junior Warden, so he had to rescind his post as piper when he actually took up the floor position, because he couldn't be in his constant place right. if he was the piper. So uh, he's up at Ancient Stirling. Uh, but I'm the only other piper in the, the province at the moment. But there are some, some other areas where pipers don't, there's no pipers at all, there's no organists. Right. Some lodges, uh, one my own uh, affiliate lodge here, we don't have enough numbers for that. Well, so now, again, it varies. The piper literally plays the bagpipes. That's his job, correct? And is everyone expected to serve as piper then? Or is that no. part of the provincial life? Okay. No, there's, uh, again, it's very much in the case of uh, Scottish Constitution. If you have one, it is, uh, it's definitely adds to the ceremony. Uh, it's something that uh, certainly when provincial deputations arrive, it's something that uh, is great honour to actually lead in provincial. And I know for our own rededication recently on our uh, 250th, uh, recently, it was uh, I'm very honoured to lead in Grand Lodge. Uh, themselves so that was that's quite an honor to be able to do that and it's something that uh, as a piper it's unique and it's something that uh, I'll definitely treasure as long as possible right. but certainly if I do aim to progress I'll have to give that role to somebody else if there's a piper qualified okay so back in Christopher, can, Christopher can I just add to that as Go someone ahead. who's had the privilege of leading deputations as a, a substitute provincial grandmaster in the province mm -hmm. Having a piper pipe you into the lodge is certainly a, a unique experience and more so than if you're just rapping on the door and then coming in in procession, having the pipes play you in, uh, it certainly brings uh, the hairs on the back of the neck standing up and it just makes you stand that little bit, a couple of inches taller and prouder that uh, you're being led in by the sound of the peabroch. I imagine. Well, I would say Christopher, I would say, as for our point of view, 636, I think we have, a, I might be corrected, we have 22, 23 office bearers, but the progression only starts at inner guard. So from inner guard to the chair, possibly six, seven years, the rest of the positions in our lodge, aren't, they're not progressive. You mm -hmm. must be nominated and elected, but you're okay. not progressive. That, okay, that, that, that sounds more in keeping, more in line with what we do. I was going to say that the organist is optional in every lodge. Most lodges don't have one. My lodge had one briefly, and he played the violin, and it just didn't seem to work. <laughs> to have a violin. He wasn't any good playing the piano. We had a piano. Uh, but that's a position where once you're appointed, you would stay, you know, because you can actually play a musical instrument. It wouldn't make sense to make it a progression. That would be hard, as Brother Scott pointed out. If you had to wait to play the bagpipes before... You'd be allowed to go in line. <laughs> that could keep a lot of people. But there, that is a good way to keep out the undesirables. You must spend at least a year and be proficient in bagpipes before you're allowed to be inner guard and progress. I think that would do a lot. Okay. That, again, one of those fun differences here. Um, and by the way, let's see, go on to the next one here. Brother David, um, is it called a blue lodge or to use the term craft lodge, symbolic lodge? For referring to the uh, the regular Masonic Lodge, what term do you use? We tend to use both names. Okay. Um, again, it's not it's not specified. It's just down to individual preference. So both can be used. Okay. <laughs> All right. And um, Brother Keegan, um, can the Worshipful Master serve more than one term? Generally one not. Term. Okay. Generally not, but. Uh, because of the, uh, the the plague of the Black Death that we're all experiencing just now, uh, our, our guy uh, Andy McIntyre is doing two terms, but that's just simple logistics. That's an exception. Of this, you know, yeah. Everyone stayed in line then; they yeah. just stayed where they were. Makes sense. Okay, 
Uh, Christopher, can I can I say that yeah. that's regional as well. Many provinces in Fife and Kinross and on the East Coast, it's traditional for the master to serve two terms uh, oh, as really? a standard. And I, I, I believe a lot of West Coast lodges are one one term lodges. So again, that that's one of the beauties of Scotland, province to province. There are so many differences. Oh wow! Well, that's that's why I've got a big panel then, because y'all can correct. Us West Coasters have a very short lifespan, so that's why we. So, (laughs) (laughs) so Gordon, you say? I think I think Mother Cogwin is also two years. So yeah, I don't know. uh, Certainly, and hang on, hang on a sec, hang on a sec, hang on, Gordon. Just clarify what area of Scotland is it you say that's typically it's a two-year term? I, I would suggest that most places out with. Uh, the West Central Belt are two-year lodges. So okay. Ayrshire, Glasgow, Lanarkshire are predominantly one-year lodges, mm-hmm. but the rest of uh, Scotland, I would suggest, are more two-year master terms. And, and how many how many elected offices in the progressive line then that serve two terms? Again, you, when you look at the constitutional laws of the Grand Lodge of Scotland, they say they, they list what lodges any lodge can have. And you can fill, as the, the gents have said, you can fill whatever wants. Generally, progression would be from around Bible bearer inner guard through. So you're talking uh, starting at the bottom of progression, maybe 16 years right. uh, wow. to the chair. But the majority of people, I would suggest, do it between eight and 12 years because okay. people pull out. Oh, yes. Uh, and that's something that, um, in fact, we may well have a discussion on in a future meeting is, the uh, the consider the possibility of because we have five um, five elected officers treasurer and secretary do not rotate in and out it's the deacons <clears throat> then the wardens then the master but they're elected officially in between the wardens and the deacons it's just how we're structured but a treasurer and secretary typically pass masters and typically stay for a long time but Christopher, um, Christopher we, we actually have lodges inside our own province that uh-huh. are different. So okay. as, Gordon's, as Gordon's saying by area, right. ins- inside your province, some lodges, each position is uh, two I get years. That. There is no consistent uh, rule. I get that. Well, I was going to say, um, we have, um, I've posited the idea of what if we made each, because the trouble we have, of course, is getting someone to fill junior deacon. And it's a five-year commitment to be master. If we made you st- serve as master for two years in order to get everything done and make sure people were proficient um, getting through the chairs, you're looking at 10 years that you're committing. And I think here in America, you're not going to find a lot of men willing to commit 10 years of their life just to be master of the lodge. So what do you do? Do you make the junior and senior deacon appointed and or only one year and just the wardens and the master are two years? So it's something that we've kind of, we've kicked around here just for discussion. I also want to welcome brother Shelby Chandler who just joined us. He's from our research lodge here in Virginia as well. Nice to see you, brother. Thank you very much, my brother. It's a pleasure to be here. All right. um, just uh, I saw I was I was at another Zoom meeting and yes. as soon as I could, I jumped in. I so, appreciate it. I, I wasn't problem. able to attend. I had to get ready for this one, but I would like to be there. Understand. Well, you're, you're jumping in in the middle, so you'll have to go back and watch it on YouTube to catch what you're no, doing. It's, it sounds like yeah, they're <laughs> talking about the, some of the difficulties with uh, – uh, keeping a full five line where in other uh, jurisdictions they have three. And I think things are not, uh, you're saying it's, it's not always the same. In well, here, jur- here we're saying they actually have 22 officers depending and, but only I think eight or so are elected, but in some cases it's a two year term. So that's 16 years to be master. I see. Okay. All right. Moving along. Um, da, 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 da. Move, move, move off. Um, Brother, and Chris, office bearer, and it's an office bearer. Mm-hmm. What they're called oh. office bearers in Scotland, not officers. Office, oh, okay, office bearer. Okay, collectively, yeah. not yeah, with a high, hyphen and small b. Understood. Okay, fair enough. Um, brother Dillett, um, how many members in your lodge? And is that typical for Scotland? we? We have got around 50, 50 55 members in our lodge. Paying members. Okay. Is that yeah. typical, you would say, for your area? No. No. Okay. There's, there's some lodges uh, some lodges struggling a wee bit at the moment, but we, we've been really lucky that we've managed to... We, we had to go outside of Broxburn where our lodge is, 
because mm -hmm. we had to sell the, the, the building and we, we, we lost a lot of members when we had to leave the town. But we've managed to come back to the town now, to Broxburn, and our membership is really growing year after year and a lot of young members, which is also a benefit. So mm -hmm. we've been really lucky in the last two, three years we've come back to Broxburn, but our membership is on the rise and hopefully it will continue. Okay, very good. Okay, um, Brother Taggart, uh, what is the average age of the members of your lodge? I don't know if I can disclose that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm frightened to hazard, I guess. Um, as my right was from Master said, we are getting younger members through the door now. Um, we've not, I, I don't know, maybe eight, nine, ten past Masters or older. What we did have as well, we had returning members coming back who had been uh, lodge members for 20, 25 years who hadn't attended um, right. older members. So... To be honest, we have a really mixed age. Um, I would probably say that our average age, a rough guess, 45 to 50, 55, okay. something okay. along the line. And is it is it 21 to join? Unless Some you're a Lewis. It's, if you're a Lewis and your dad's a member, you can right. join at 18. If not, 21, 21, yes. Okay, so that is the same. Okay, so not, not that different from us then. Okay, but I think I actually, on balance now, of course, this is actual members, not necessarily ones who attend. Uh, Virginia, we're like around 60, 65, I think is the average age, because we have quite a few members who live longer and are older and simply don't attend. Actually, in Lodge, I think 30s to 40s would be more accurate as far as the active ones. I don't know if it's actually anybody has it to hand, but there was recently a survey done with Grand Lodge, and one of the questions was age, mm -hmm. and it was kind of highlighted that it is an age in craft. So... The idea was to get young blood in, but that's easier said than done sometimes. True. <laughs> Very true. Okay. Uh, Brother Clark, uh, is Scotland considered York right, Scottish right, or what would you consider the right that is the Grand Lodge? What, Scottish that's Constitution. What, what Scot 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 Constitution, but not a York right or a Scottish right. That's predominantly American. Right, um, I understand. Okay, but it is so it's considered Scottish Constitution is the correct term. Yeah. Okay. Very good. You're right. And, um, and, and, and all lodges have their own ritual. There is no set ritual. Right. You mentioned that. Well, so most lodges, uh, the, the, there could be a variation of a, a similar theme, but the, most of the lodges have their own ritual. Okay. Um, there is a, Scot, uh, uh, a Scottish ritual. Uh, which has been published by Grand Lodge, but previous to that, the, the, most lodges would have their own ritual. Okay. Grand, well, Grand Lodge actually publish about six different uh, rituals. Okay. Standard ritual, so, the modern ahead, ritual, the McBride, the um, I'm trying to think of it. The, the, they used to be in St. Enoch Square in Glasgow. Goodilocks. 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 On there, they, they come in different colours. So there's a blue one, a green one, a black one, and a. I'm not sure what they've they've done with uh, the Gaudi locks one. I've got I've got one my father gave me many many years ago, which is an old Gaudi locks one. Right. Yeah. Another one is Harvey's. There's more to the. But that's the other the one. Right than the ritual itself. You can have multiple rituals and be all the same right. In, um, in terms of the right, Christopher, mm -hmm. I think. When you look at the American system where you can either go down the York right or the Scottish right, I, I would suggest that it's an amalgamation of it all because you would join the Royal Arch, you would join the, the Knights Templars, you would join the ancient accepted Scottish well, right. right. So whereas you would go down two different paths and mother might not join either, we would, if you've got the opportunity, because some you can ask to join and others are by invitation only. Right. Oh, that's a much, well, that's a much longer question, but I'm speaking specifically to the entry level and the first three degrees. And like here in America, there are only, there's only one official body and it's considered clandestine. That is Scottish, right? And that's Louisiana. All American Grand Lodges would be considered York right in their makeup, but that's only the first three lodges. The common confusion people have is we say York right, people naturally assume Royal Arch, Council, Commandery, but the actual right is refers to the first three degrees. 
I would be in favor if we want to make an argument to say we're the American right, since we do break off from England quite a bit, but it's still technically York right. But that's a fun discussion to have someone that's telling them okay, so, right, they don't so, want to believe it is. <laughs> so Chris I, Chris, I have a question about yes. ritual. Um, in Here in Ontario, Canada, we have, I don't know, 450 lodges, mm -hmm. and likely 447 of them practice the same emulation ritual, and the other ones are Irish uh, lodges and use the Irish ritual. But if we talk okay. about the kingdom of Fife, the question to the Scottish brethren is, how different is the ritual between lodges? It's, and, and, and the, the province of Fife and Kinross, we've got 49 lodges, and we probably have three or four different workings of a ritual book. And the, the other challenge we've got, someone might visit Buck and St. John and hear a lecture and think that's really nice. I want to bring it back and introduce it. And then it's maybe introduced into your, our standard workings. And or if you're visiting regularly another lodge, you might drop things out when you're presenting because you pick it up and your muscle memory forgets what you were learning in your own ritual and things drop over the years. Uh, but it's very much up to the individuals at this time to try and keep that history of the, the ritual that you started with. But there is no set, uh, whereas where with if you're an emulation lodge, it's very much word for word, parrot fashion, where our lodges is very different. And then again, it comes down to the quality of the brother presenting, uh, what he, he remembers to actually put across. And... Uh, I, if you look at myself, if I'm doing ritual, you get a different uh, ritual from Gordon every time I'm on the floor. Further to that is when uh, you have visiting lodges coming in uh, within the province there, and for example, in Stirling, so there's 23 lodges, and when Dolphin or Pullman come down to confer a degree on a candidate in Karen, they'll do things completely differently. They'll give certain signs that are presented differently than what they would be in Karen. And those uniquenesses are really what helps both gel the whole craft together, but also make you stand apart because the Pullman way in doing things is different from Zetland or different from Karen. Our ritual is called the Karen way. Uh, and that's, that's where looking both internally in the province and then outside in other provinces is a fascinating subject to study the ritual of various other orders and uh, groups. So just to be clear, there are six rituals that are uh, sanctioned or, or covered by the Grand Lodge, but each individual lodge is allowed to have its own variation somewhat within that. But if you had to group it, could you say if you had to categorize them, most of the lodge rituals could be fit into, well, this is pretty much one of these six? Or is there so much variety that, you know, you say, well, six rituals doesn't begin to cover it? I would say so much variety. The, the majority of ritual will come from those six aforementioned okay. ritual books but you will get bits and pieces out of different ones and each lodge has the ability to amalgamate it to have their own workings in effect. Okay, so if I like a paragraph that's in the uh, senior deacon's lecture in the, sec in the fellow craft, I can bring it back to my lodge and just inject it. Okay. If, you're, if your past masters were to allow you to do so, which is another question which I would yeah. doubt would happen. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, also, um, sir. Go ahead. Also also, might... Our past masters, um, I think they would agree that when I'm up on the floor, I've got my own ritual. Mm -hmm. Completely different to everybody else's ritual. Right. But <coughs> okay. good enough for me. All right. Well, I, I'm trying to keep track. And if, if I skip Chris, over you, I'm Chris, sorry. I'm trying to make sure I'm asking in order, but we are kind of Chris, jumping around. Chris, just, just, yes. just one last point on ritual. Go ahead. Uh, it, might, it might interest you to know that uh, Lord the McBride... Scottish ritual has been introduced by a lodge in Washington, D.C. So they are using that for their, their main ritual. Interesting. One of 10 worldwide right. use McBride ritual. Excellent. One in Rome, one in um, Singapore, Scottish constitution, one in Australia, in Victoria, one in Washington, D.C., and the rest in Scotland. Thank you. Okay. Um, Brother Richardson. <laughs> um, how many Grand Lodges have sprung from the Scottish Grand Lodge, the Grand Lodge of Scotland? 
Oh, that, I'm afraid I, I couldn't tell you. But uh, it's interesting to hear about the uh, ritual work. Uh, I live in a wee village, and when I was in the chair and doing other floor work, uh, someone would maybe say, oh, what are you doing tonight? And we would tell them, and they would quite simply say, oh, we're getting the skin flats version tonight. <laughs> and we had, we had one past master who was an absolutely superb ritualist. And one night we were uh, listening to him delivering a very fine lecture. And suddenly my brother's sitting next to me and I looked at each other and this brother who was delivering the lecture went off at a tangent to another, a lecture from another order, hmm. did about three sentences, brought himself right back and picked up exactly where he left off. And after the meeting, he came over and said, if either of you breathe a word. <laughs> it, it was terrific, you know. <laughs> yes, a, a few smiles there, I'm quite sure. Uh, some people get flummoxed and stuck in something and don't have that ability, but he really did very, very well that night. Interesting to hear about uh, the comments on the uh, ritual. Yes. When, uh, when we have a meeting, uh, we go around our brethren and say, on such and such a night, would you like to do the lecture on? And it's usually volunteers. Some lodges have a, a, a master who will give the whole degree and it, it's to be admired where uh, somebody delivers the whole degree from start to finish, the conferring master he's called. And the, generally speaking, the, uh, it's shared out among the brethren, the work is shared out. And uh, generally the youngsters get a wee taste on the floor and then they grow and get into the higher orders and are expected to take on more of the lectures that are given. I was uh, lucky that uh, in my progression, there were three brethren dropped out for various reasons, and I advanced six years oh, my. from from the uh, the door uh, where I was in a guard. I went. I missed out both deacons and went to junior warden, and from there eventually went to the chair. Had two two terms in the chair. And my successor, unfortunately, could only do one year. So as immediate past master, I was called back to the chair, as was my duty, and did a third term. And uh, it was an experience. Um, Brother Clark, um, can you explain, since you are one, how, what exactly is an immediate past master and how does that work? Because we do not have such a thing. Well, when I came out the chair, I become the immediate past master because I was the master and I, then I'm immediately past right. the chair. Um, <laughs> that much I figured out on my own. <laughs> that, 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 and it's, it's not an elected office. It's an office by right. Um, and it's not actually an office. You're not an office bearer, but you're there. And you assist the, mas the new master uh, in carrying out his duties uh, by sitting next to him. In, in your in your lodge, then is it one year term? So the master serves one term. It's, one year, I'm sorry. It, 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 it's, it's been one year, but we 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 have gone to two years, and unfortunately, this year Gordon, who is the master, uh, this past year has ended up being two years because the pandemic uh, right. brought that about. Um, but Gordon was only going to be doing the one year. Uh, right. So you would because, serve one year as immediate past master. So what ex do you sit in the East? Sit in the East. Okay. And what do you do that you sort of advise him? Yeah. I don't okay. fall asleep. Okay. Tell us sure what I've done wrong. Make, oh, yeah. make, make, you sit there and make sure he does the ritual the way that you do it, not right. the way that he does it. <laughs> I will. I will share with you all at this point since it's, uh, since it's written, I can share this. Um, when you, uh, the, the, the sign of a past master in Virginia is in my year to the uh, current master. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. And uh, the way I learned it, uh -huh. the past master sign is like this. 
Right. Your arms. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. All right, then. Um, Brother Dale, um, how long is the process from EA to fellow craft to Master Mason, typically? How many months? Well, uh, typically in all my lodges, uh, well, it would only really be a month between degrees to, mm -hmm. unless, for example, if we had an entered apprentice, then we had to do uh, a raisin or something for somebody else. But it's re mainly, it is just a month to month, a month or two between degrees, depending on what work. Uh, unfortunately, most of my lodges don't have a, a full program. So, you know, we've got plenty of time. Well, we need do something. you have to stand a catechism to go from EA to Fellowcraft? Yeah, it's a very simple, all my lodges is a very simple catechism, uh, usually between between eight to 12 questions between degrees. Ah, However, okay. there's a lot of sister lodges within both my provinces where you can do upwards of 60, 70, 80. And it's extremely impressive when you get a, a relatively new candidate being able, able to do this. It's, it's almost a whole degree. Right. But uh, in my own lodges, uh, any sort of proficiency is just a, a very short uh, catechism really and okay. progressing through the degrees uh, is, is almost uh, automatic really it's just a few months uh, between degrees at most uh, right. that's the reality of it you know maybe people would say they've got to prove the worth and that but in reality I find in my lodges it's just a case of one two three right. and of course in Scotland we have the we work the mark degree as well in our craft lodges. Right. And we'll get into that. <laughs> I'll get into that. Yeah. Um, yeah just while, while we're on that one there, Chris, I was actually yeah. just holding up here the test questions that we have from Grand Lodge of Scotland. They're available for purchase on the website. I'm not getting a commission, but certainly mm -hmm. they're available there. And it's something that uh, we're all encouraged to look at and learn. And it's like you say there, about 10, 12 questions on each one. Uh, for mm -hmm. each degree and progression. Chris, could I just ask? Go the, ahead. The, the, everybody, it's here. You could join. You could join Buck and St John and be in your third degree in six weeks. But yeah. we do not ask a single question for each can for each degree. Um, that works for us. I've seen other lodges. Uh, what relief in Edinburgh springs to mind? I think for the second to the third, sixty odd questions, yeah. and I've seen a guy standing trembling. Now, everybody's to their own. Do you think that's a good thing, a bad thing? But you don't, you don't have any kind of catechism then? No. Okay. In, 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 in St. Margaret's Hope, they do the questions out with in the adjacent because of this, 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 this what you said, Kevin, is not because it's, it's six weeks and you're three, you're three degrees um, because we meet twice a month. Um, and I was eight weeks as a ma as a master mason, and I went away back to sea, so I didn't have any time to learn anything. So everything I learned was on the hoof. The, what we're encouraged to do once you're through, by the way, once you're through your first degree, we encourage the guys to go visit as much as possible, so they can pick up experience yeah. through different. What, it's like it's going back to me with what you said there later on because you go to different lodges with different ritual you can go to a lodge that's five minutes ten minutes up the road and they'll do something different and they'll, they'll, their floor work will be different as well so we yeah. actively encourage the guys to go out visit and to see and gather experience that way like I say I'm not against the questions it's just different ways of doing it right. so is it is it more about instruction and mentorship than anything else um you could possibly say that um, it's, it's it's going back to the old thing that you can learn ritual, but you, you don't actually know what you're delivering. It's just coming. It's actually a, 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 a getting knowledge about the ritual. So we can all, well, I'm saying most of us are experienced here. You can stand up, but you, do you actually understand what you're trying to teach a candidate or is it just spewing out till you get off the floor? So I'm, take, I'm asking, I'm asking because not much, I mean, I mean, my lodge has its origins in Scottish masonry, Fredericksburg Lodge Number Four, and uh, my research has shown that they did more instructing and and 
of course, catechisms actually came up much later. But the thing is, they did much instruction, uh, instruction and mentoring than anything else. Um, I'm just trying to find out. Uh, I guess is that the thing because it was more along the lines of learning by watching uh, and observation from uh, your travels than anything else when you first start. Well, it worked for me, and it worked for my right Russell master who's on the screen as well. Our proposer and seconders, especially our proposer, made sure he he spent time with us and took us out. I know it's it as different in Scotland. I mean. Our lodge, six three six meets twice a week. Um, uh, sorry, twice a month. Sorry, twice a month. <laughs> no, twice a week. <laughs> uh, so some lodges are down to once a month and stuff like that. So it's it's try to keep a new member active, so it does go and, and and keep the momentum going. I've just like I said, I've seen some guys standing there, and you feel you actually feel for them. You feel sorry for these guys, and I, I always wondered if there was ever a count. To see a guy's gone through, he's second, for his second degree, his third degree, and he knows he's got 60 questions to answer, but he doesn't come back. Is that a possibility? Yeah. Yep. Well, that's that's that, that's come up here as well. I would say, just my opinion, is you, you, you do need to learn. I mean, one of the things masonry teaches us is the ability of public speaking. And yes, it is a lot of pressure. I agree. But you make it through that when it comes time to actually deliver ritual within the lodge, it's going to be a breeze because like, well, I'm not the only guy saying it, you know, but I guess you can have some debate on whether that's effective or not, or people feel intimidated or not, or, or what have you. But the only thing I would say in that, Chris, as well, that no every Mason wants to do a ritual. This is true. This is true. But to be, I mean, it's, it's a part of Masonry. Clearly, if <laughs> you are really into ritual like myself, you can go and learn all the lectures and you can get all the public speaking you want. But if you expect to be an officer in the lodge, you do have to at least know how to open and close and, and do the degree work. So um, go on, Brother uh, Gordon. So how often does your lodge meet? Because I think we should ask this early on. And um, like your, your regular stated meetings, do you meet at certain days or how does that work? Yeah, my, my mother lodge, I, we meet I, during the months of September through to April and we meet twice a month. Okay. And you you can have a variety. You can have what we would call a regular meeting, and that would be akin to your stated meeting when we do business. And we have two regular meetings a month. And uh, but some lodges, uh, if they can decide to have a, a special meeting, which is an additional one. Mm -hmm. And in the past, my lodge, when we've been struggling for numbers, we went to one regular, one special, because your special meetings can't be more than your regular meetings. And at your special meeting, you don't need to conduct the, the business of the lodge. So your secretary and your treasurer's work. Uh, so uh, over the Masonic season, we would have 18 meetings. And one of those would be the installation meeting. And uh, one would be the annual general meeting where we approve the, the accounts and uh, any business of the lodge uh, that is not done throughout the year. And with our research lodge, uh, we currently meet four times a year. And the research lodges tend to meet less often and have a an individual to come forward and present a paper. Right. Uh, so you would have three papers and an installation. So, um, and you meet on the Master Mason's degree, unless you're doing degree work, of course. If it's business, No, we would always open in the first degree. You open uh, the first degree? And, okay. and our business is conducted in the first degree. In the first degree, and interesting. Unless we are a, a, doing our a nominations and elections, for our elections, we have to be in the third degree for elections of office bearers. Ah, interesting. Okay. Uh, in, in Virginia, typically, and you would meet like on like, say, uh, first and third thursday or something yeah. like that okay yeah yeah virginia we we have a stated meeting it must be in the bylaws so like ocean view is second friday of the month so we have to meet and that's the only time we can vote on petitions and conduct business and such all the other fridays are kept for um, degree nights or educational meetings or what have you and we can open on whatever degree we see fit but typically it'll be open in the masters obviously if we're working uh, you know, we're going to do an EA. We only open on the EA degree and, and so on. Okay. And then we would then we would have committee meetings that would, uh, for for my my mother lodge, it would be the opposite Wednesdays. So we would actually meet every Wednesday, but your regular meeting would be the second and fourth, and our committee meetings would be the first and third, and oh, that's when we would do our loosely termed lodge of instruction. That's when the guys would come down. We would practice the degree work. 
okay. to make sure that everyone was comfortable. And if a new brother wanted to present a piece of work for the first time, they're not doing it to a candidate or to uh, a stand-in candidate. Right. Uh, does anybody just open up to the floor? Is there any lodge that routinely does not meet two times a month? Or is that typical for Scotland? Uh, lodge Kelburn's once a month. Okay. Um, yeah. And, and we take a summer break as well because we like to go and sun ourselves in the good Scottish weather. Hey, Brother Chris? Yes. Just to let you know, uh, going through the old proceedings of the Grand Lodge Virginia from the uh, circa mm -hmm. 19th century, Mm -hmm. uh, we too used to do two two days uh, in the month. Uh, right. Normally, it was like we had first and third, second and fourth. Uh, somewhere down the line, and during the 1900s, uh, we stopped doing that. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, I I know for sure that not everything we do has been always that way, but we just sort of we just like we've had some changes. Yes, we always <laughs> well Freemasonry never changes until it does. Okay, uh, brother Scott. Um, what are your dues in your lodge? How much you join and how much do you pay? Is it yearly? Is it monthly? So at the moment, um, we actually we, we actually have a saying. Um, we, we don't talk about dues in Scotland. Um, okay. So when, when, when you're asked a question um, about how much it costs to become a mason, we don't actually tell anyone. Um, and I don't know if this, I know we're talking about the differences within Scotland. I don't know if this is something that's consistent across the, the entire country um, or if it's something, as I found out recently, is quite specific to the West. And I'd be interested to open it to the, the floor and, and hear other people's take on this. Um, but when we're asked how much it co costs to become a Mason, our answer is an old shoe of my mother's. And that's, that's the only answer we give. So, so Chris, can I jump yeah. in here? Yes, Just, please. I, I have a good friend here in Ontario who tells me that when he went to his initiation, mm -hmm. before he went to his initiation, he asked how much it was going to cost. And they said, is that going to make a difference to you joining the lodge? Just bring your checkbook. So, Scott, Brother Scott, I'd ask you the same question. Did you know before you were initiated or did you show up at your initiation with your checkbook prepared to write a check? Uh, well, I, I was a Lewis, um, and fortunately, both my uh, both my grandparents and my father were in the lodge, and okay. uh, it, it was kind of taken care of on my behalf. Okay, fair. That's fair. So, <laughs> um, that's All probably right. the easiest way to, to say that. Um, I was young, 18, and wasn't in work at that particular moment in time. Um, but yeah, the, it, it's... Certainly through my experience, with we've, we've been lucky to have quite a lot of candidates coming in. There's usually a quiet word had with them. Um, well, okay, by David, proposal or I, I'm, I'm sorry. Are you literally saying it is not, it is a secret what you pay in dues? That's not something that's ever discussed in Lodge? It's not saying? a secret. Sure. We, would, we would tell I, them, but it's not discussed in Lodge, no. Okay, so uh, we have yeah. a, a, a part of our ritual, the Modi preparation. And we actually say exactly what Scott said. But what it is, 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 is if the question is asked from another Freemason, how much does it cost you to join? That's your answer. But if, ask, if you get asked, if somebody asks you how much it is to join, we, we tell them we have £220 initiation fee and £40 test fees. Okay. That's what we pay. Okay. So it's part of your ritual that we make sure that if somebody comes to us and asks us how much it is to join, we will tell them. I see. Okay, that's interesting. And, and further to that as well, I know this doesn't happen in every uh, lodge in Scotland as well. Uh, the test fees are annual and they are set by the individual lodges. But I know certainly uh, with our own lodge at Carner, we also offer a lifetime membership, ah, which okay. is eight to ten times your annual test fee. And that means then you don't pay for your test fees right. for the rest of your days, which is actually very helpful if we've got some of the, the brethren there working offshore, for example, uh, or working in services. They can be posted abroad for three months or six months. So their test fees could lapse. Having an annual or sorry, a lifetime membership means that they never go in bad standing. They always remain in right. good standing until they decide to uh, move on. We can, have I, can I just ask them, because yeah. in 2000, well, I joined 2013, the same as Alan, 
and we were told at the time that Grand Lodge had abolished the lifetime membership. So is that an individual thing that you given? Uh, to be honest with you, I don't know. Uh, I was very fortunate to go through, uh, oh geez, it would be 2001 now, and I was advised then by my dad there as my proposer and both uh, him and my seconder, David Godfrey, who was the secretary. They had the quiet word and says, take the, uh, your lifetime membership. It will help you and it will pay off. Well, and let me ask. Let me ask. Life, life, really life membership doesn't, doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, it doesn't exist anymore. It doesn't okay. Exist anymore. Okay. So okay. Thank, thanks for clearing that it, up then. Thank you. Was it a Grand Lodge enacted thing or was it yeah. a lodge? Yeah. Okay. In Virginia. Yeah. But, but, but Christopher, it was voted on by the beauty of Scottish Freemasonry and Grand Lodge. Uh -huh. Individual lodges, we're members. We are who make up the Grand Lodge of Scotland. Right. Right. So we make the vote. And so it, it wasn't the, the office bearers or Grand Lodge, that entity that dictated that life membership will no longer exist. It was what we would say the body of the lodge because we had to vote on that deliberation. Right. And the deliberation won that life membership would cease to exist. So someone brought and up many of us around here are life members, but the lodge, if you're a life member, the lodge still needs to pay the annual fee to Grand Lodge. So in my instance, I would give a donation to my mother lodge to cover that. And if you're in multiple lodges, you've got multiple dues to pay, your lodge has multiple dues to pay if you're active. But there is a way for a life member who's not been in the lodge, you then don't, for a, a, a period of time, you then don't, you can take him off the Grand Lodge database and you don't pay for them. Okay. So you're not paying for all these what, life uh, members that have never been in the lodge for 10, 15 years. Well, what, what we do in the Grand Lodge of Virginia, it was, I'm saying because there's a difference between the Grand Lodge enacting a plan and individual lodges having something that where they do that sort of thing. The Grand Lodge of Virginia enacted it many years ago and it was 16 times your dues because the thought is all the money goes into this fund and this mutual fund makes enough money from interest alone to cover all of the yearly dues. It recently went up to 20 times membership because the investments weren't bringing in enough at 16 times. I was fortunate to have bought it when it came out at 16 times. I think I paid $550 for my Blue Lodge for life. And that was yeah. a good investment for me because it's more than paid itself off. Yeah, I did 16 times also. And mine was like 1500 but it, I paid it and I haven't touched it since. But the thing is, is that uh, the one thing about the kind that we have is that it doesn't really benefit the lodge until after we pass away. And then that money is free money pretty much going to the lodge. Right. Well, that, that, that's a matter of debate. You can argue that it's not helping. For example, if let's say I bought my life membership, I think it was more, no, it might've been 800, whatever it was. I think it was 800 something. My dues at the time I joined was 50, it's time I bought my life membership, I think it was 50 or $55. And then that transferred to the lodge that I later affiliated with. They get, the Grand Lodge gets $25 every year. My lodge gets 30 because that's how it was done at that time. Today, my lodge charges $140 per member and over 40 or $45 goes to the Grand Lodge, which means my lodge gets money from me, but the money that goes to Grand Lodge to offset me is just the amount that I was paying then. My lodge still only gets $30 a year out of me. But Chris, but a new member comes in tomorrow, is on, they're going to get $90 a year out of him. But, but Chris, when you so, pass away, you don't pay a set, your lodge don't pay assessment. That's all free money. Well, this the, is the true. It, income, it happens after the fact, but not only that. It's, it's but more it's, of a it's, benefit it's, after you die, yes. Right, and, and it's important for the lodge to make sure that uh, uh, that they can manage with the money that they have. The, the one thing oh, you true. don't want to do is tell every single person to get an LMIP and have them do it because that lodge is not going to be able to function as well. Which well, yes, because they'll be locked in. Let's say today every member of our lodge bought a life membership and the lodge is going to get $100 per person forever. Well, five years from now, the operating costs require at least $120 for each active member. Yeah, they're going to be in a, they're be in a tough bind. They can't just raise dues to address their operating costs. But that leaves it. That, that can be a much better. I think that's what they realized in Scotland. I think that was that not one of the main reasons yeah. behind getting rid of the life membership. I think so. We had too many life, we had too many life members who had only paid pennies. And right. yet we're having to pay pounds to Grand Lodge for them. It was right. costing lodges 
an enormous amount of money if they had lots of life members. Well, no, that's that's the thing. Just to be clear, the do whatever the assessment was from Grand Lodge for me when I bought my life membership, that's what the Grand Lodge is able to collect for me. They're not able to collect what they currently collect, so they have to keep track of it. If they're getting if they were getting twenty five dollars in 1980, uh, 1995, um, and they're collecting forty five dollars today, they don't get to assess my lodge forty five dollars for me. They're only allowed to assess your your, your, your lifetime right. thirty your lifetime thirty pound in some lodges have right. been have been expunged with one payment to Grand Lodge, and right. people have been living off that for a long time as life members. They weren't right. necessarily putting any more money into the the right. lodge. Okay. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> I don't want to get bogged down too much in this. Um, so, uh, Brother Cameron, aside from, um, well, we kind of wouldn't even do this. Um, okay. How do you dress for Lodge? And maybe different for you where you are. But <laughs> in in, in uh, Hong Kong, um, for my mother Lodge, it was uh, a tuxedo. Okay. Uh, for the uh, other lodge that I was, Scottish lodge I was a member with, it was a dark suit and, and Masonic tie. And in the Philippines, it's uh, dark pants and a, a barang, barong Tagalog. Right. Yep. Filipino I think, uh, shirt. You are, I think because of the climate, you were not a good choice for that question. <laughs> Brother <laughs> Gavin, what is typical for you to wear to your meetings? And does it vary uh, depending on stated annuals and so forth? Uh, yeah, I mean, predominantly it's a dark suit uh, right. with a tie, lodge tie. Uh, but certainly then if there's a provincial deputation, uh, office bearers would be black and white, uh, which is a, a tuxedo, bow tie. Mm -hmm. uh, but certainly we also have the option there, as I'm sure everyone else will have uh, been in some point in the past, to have uh, the kilt worn. Uh, so I know for, that as a piper, I would always go to a black and white in my kilt every time uh, but certainly it's typically it's just a dark suit with a lodge tie so would the officers wear tuxedos on some occasions the office bearers sorry wear yes. tuxedos and the regular members would be able to wear dark suit yes that's correct okay. uh, right. especially when it's uh, things like a provincial uh, deputation that's visiting or we're conferring a degree out, out with the province or there's a a group coming in, another lodge coming in to confer a degree, the office bearers would be black and white, and then the rest of the brethren and the columns would just be in their dark suits. Right. Okay. Uh, Brother Rintoul, are there, I think it's a given, but um, are there lectures for each degree? Yes. Okay. Yeah, quite, quite, quite specific set of lectures for each degree. Um, but again, as Gordon mentioned earlier, they will vary from lodge to lodge as people put their own personal um, personal touch on the lectures or copy words from other places. But essentially, there, there are different ones. All right. Are you, let me ask, follow up. Are you allowed to confer the degree on more than one person at a time? Like if you had two candidates ready, do you ever do two the same night? Would you do them yes. jointly? Okay. Yes, you can do several candidates on the one evening. Okay. And that's typical, or I'm assuming everybody has enough <laughs> candidates. <laughs> it's not, not so typical these days, uh, mm -hmm. I think, with the shortage of candidates. But when I joined, there was um, five of us joined on the same evening, mm -hmm. and we went through all three degrees together. Okay. But you all came <laughs> in, like you all came in as a group, or there, were there certain? Yes. I, I don't want to get into the specifics, but you all, all five of you came, went around the room as one, basically? Yes. Okay. Yes. Interesting. We usually, we, we usually do more than one candidate at the MAP degree, as we only do it once a year. We only do the MAP right. degree once a year, so we usually have more than one candidate at the MAP degree. Right. Hey, go ahead. Let's go ahead and explain. What, what is the Mark Mason degree, and how does that work in, in a blue lodge? Because that's what I'm curious about. How, how do you do that? What is it, where does that fall in with the other degrees? Like you get the Mark Mason after a Master Mason, or when do you yeah. confer? Alan. So it's it's oh. it's through a convention with the Supreme Grand Royal Arch Chapter of Scotland okay. that the, the the Blue Lodge can work it, and it is generally seen as the fourth step 
that you would take. So you would have your first degree in apprentice, second fellow of craft, third degree master mason, and then you would take your mark master mason's degree as your fourth step. And uh, as David was uh, alluding to there, it's generally done uh, historically at the end of the season, you would capture all your candidates and do it together. Mm. Uh, because of the lack of candidates in certain areas, you're seeing more and more marks being worked throughout it. But you can also receive your mark degree within the Royal Arts chapter as well. Uh, and whereas if you look at the United Grand Lodge of England, they don't recognise it as part of their structure. And there is a separate body, the Grand Lodge of Mark Master Masons of England and Wales, right. that uh, confers the, the Mark degree. We went, we, last week, uh, we had in this time slot, we had um, the Virginia Research Royal Arts Chapter met. And I had the opportunity to give a paper on uh, the cryptic degrees. And I did some research into how England does it and what all is very interesting because of course England has, they have a mark, they have a grand lodge of Mark master masons and they have a grand Royal arch chapter that only confers the Royal arch degree. Whereas here in, in the U S of course, a Royal arch chapter confers in Virginia, the Mark master, the past master, select master, Royal master, most excellent master, and then Royal arch. We have the council degrees inside of the Royal Arch, and that's only Virginia, West Virginia. Other jurisdictions have their own grand council. So let me ask you this. In the, grand, in the Royal Arch chapter in Scotland, how many <coughs> degrees are conferred? Gordon. Three. Three. Three, which is? What are they? Excellent master. Excellent master. Mark master Mason in Royal Arch. Okay. Interesting. Okay. And it's only if you're the, the, Mark, in the, the chair Mark, of the, the Royal Arch. Yeah, if you're in the chair of the Royal Arch, you get the secrets of a past master of the Mark. Oh. Where the, like oh, I, okay. I, I, I conferred Mark degrees in the Craft Lodge, but I wasn't a past master in the Mark. But oddly, now that I'm in the chair of the Royal Arch, you get, you get the, the secrets so, of the past master of the Mark. Well, this but is interesting. Know, because the Mark, okay trying to say what I can say. The Mark Mason degree in the U.S. involves chopping off somebody's hand. It, it is a follow-up pretty much from the fellow craft degree. The past master's degree is where you are actually installed in the chair. And it's in, in Virginia. You must have the past master degree to be elected junior warden so you can actually be master of lodge. You must be a virtual past master and receive that degree. But it sounds like you all Chris, if I can, if I can, yeah, go ahead. If I can just add in there, Please. because in the, the uh, Grand Lodge of the Philippines or the York Rite of the Philippines work, the American style degrees. Yes, so yes, I, excellent. Uh, having yeah. visited them both, so I know a lot about them. I think it goes back to the, the old days as, as actually happened in England as well. You had to be a past master of a craft lodge before mm -hmm. you could join the Royal Arch degree. So when the York, right. York Rite Switch, switched from that, they brought in the uh, past master virtual uh, as a separate degree. So I have attended a, a past master virtual. So in uh, Scotland, does the Royal Arch degree have part of what we consider the past master's degree as far as being seated in the chair as King Solomon? No, no. It's a Mark Master, I thought, said. Yeah, so yeah. Can, I, can I just ask a question, Chris? Yeah. Do you, when you go through, are installed as a master of the lodge, do you go through an inner working where you're given the secrets of the chair of the lodge? Or do that's, you attend? That's in the past master's degree. But you don't have one in the, the lodge? In the blue lodge, no. Well, there was, say, because in the Philippines. The, the past master's degree is actually owned by the, by the Grand Lodge of Virginia. Correct. It's conferred by the Royal Arch. Uh, so basically it is owned by Grand Lodge and therefore it you know, the, the degree is, uh, is specifically Blue Lodge. So, yes, uh, it's, it's, it's tied to the, uh, the conferring the secret or the past, uh, 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 you know, that allows but you it's, to become master. But I understand that it has nothing to do with getting installed as master of the lodge. So the night that you're installed master of the lodge, you're simply installed. However, in order something. to get there, you must have served as a warden. In order to be elected junior warden, elected, not even installed, but even be elected junior warden, you must have received the past master's degree 
and you can either get it from a provisional lodge or from the Royal Arch, joining the Royal Arch chapter and receiving it as one of the degrees in the chapter. So you're qualified before you're even a junior warden to be master because you've received the secrets. And then by the time you actually get to the East and installed in the East, you've already qualified. Whereas I understand in other places, it was the night of or something. It was very, it was directly tied to being, you're going to be installed worshipful master. You need this degree. Whereas Virginia would sort of take care of it two years earlier before you get to be junior ward. Similar concept. We just executed it quite differently. So to ask a question about that, then, because yes. I'm probably and quite possibly the only person here that's not a past master. Mm. Um, no, but no, uh, close. <laughs> Close, um, yeah, so not, in not Scotland linear. then, to, yeah. to the brethren that have experienced this, would the equivalent of that for us be during the installation when the right worshipful master or a uh, right worshipful master elect is removed from the lodge? Or in, I know in some places they stay in the lodge and it's the, the, the brethren that are removed from the lodge. Is that what's happening there in a the Scottish equivalent? Yeah, but and it's not technically a degree; it's a ceremonial of yeah. installed master. A okay. Ceremony of installed when, master. Yeah. When you look at the the very first uh, law in the Constitution and laws of the Grand Lodge of Scotland, and I'll read it out to you: Constitution of Membership. The Grand Lodge of Ancient Free and Accepted Masons of Scotland is a corporate body governing governing the three degrees of Freemasonry within lodges under its jurisdiction namely those of Entered Apprentice, Fellow of Craft, brackets including the Mark, and Master Mason. Grand Lodge authorises no other degrees, but recognises a ceremonial of installed master. And that's when the Master of the Blue Lodge is, that's his big annual meeting when he becomes a new master. And within that, there's lots of different workings of it. You can have a full a ceremonial or it could be a shortened one if you if you're going in for a second or a third time and uh, or the or six <laughs> times no but yeah uh, <laughs> and but that's a ceremonial it's not classed as a degree and whereas what they always talking about earlier about the degree of a, a past mark master mason in the blue lodges as a mark uh, as the, the master or a past master or anyone can become the be the mark master mason to work that uh, ceremonial of mark master mason within the royal arch you can then get the secrets of a past master of a mark master mason's lodge well, let me ask a question okay so the mark master degree that's conferred in scotland does that involve chopping off someone's hand Potentially. That. Huh? Potentially. <laughs> and is that the same as, well, let me ask Cameron because he's seen both. Is that the same as the Mark Mason as conferred in the American version of the Royal Arch? Um, yes. Except okay. uh, your, uh, Mar uh, sorry, it's your chapter degree that includes yes. what's in, the, in Scottish is the, the excellent master degree. But yes, the Mark is virtually identical. Okay. So, and that is not anything to do with what's conferred on an incoming master in the Blue Lodge. Okay. Nope. So that's more like the past master's degree then. Or is it? <laughs> I just heard oh, you, that. You, I, don't, I don't want to. In, in, in the, in the Philippines, I have, to, I have seen both uh, the uh, past master virtual that they do in the uh, Royal Arts chapter under right. the York Rite. And also in the Grand Lodge of the Philippines, they have a separate ceremonial, which they do once a year at the annual meeting for all masters who've been installed during the year. Okay. They attend and they do the um, ceremony of a past master, which is fairly similar to the Scottish one. But I've okay. seen them actually work the chapter one in the Grand Lodge of the Philippines, the annual uh, ANCOM meeting. And okay. you, don't, you don't actually, Christopher, have to be a warden of a lodge to be the master of a lodge in Scotland. Well, that, I know. that elected uh, direct. That. Well, in Virginia, you do. You must have served one year as a warden to be elected master. So the way that they qualify people to be a master, to make sure every master has had the past master's degree, is to make sure that every warden has had the past master's degree. 
So they, we kind of do it a few years earlier. Okay. Well, that's very interesting. Well, so, but going back to the Mark Master then, is there a distinction? Okay, I'll put it this way. Is there a distinction between the Mark Master Mason degree you get in the Blue Lodge and the one you would get in the Royal Arch? No. Are they similar and there's just more in the Royal Arch? Same. Under the Concordat, they're supposed to be the same degree, use the same ritual. Okay. All right, then. Interesting. But if you already have your mark in the blue and you affiliate to, you join a Scottish Lodge, you have something called an affiliate to the mark. You don't okay. What? So if I'm, if I'm in a Scottish Lodge and I get the Mark Mason degree within my blue lodge and then I join the Royal Arch, I'm going to get the Mark Mason degree all over again? No, you get an affiliate. No. You get an affiliate. Okay. You don't actually get the degree conferred on you. Okay. Yeah, but Chris, if you, if you yes. think about it, the Mark Master within the Blue Lodge uh, uh, arena makes far more sense in some ways based on the storyline and the purpose. Agreed. That's the, that's what I thought was interesting. Well, the Royal Arch, it's, it's, it's all very interesting. The more you dig into it, it's like, well, that doesn't make sense, but... Yeah. Um, yeah. The Royal Arch uh, degrees are interesting. Well, like I mentioned, the cryptic degrees, which well, are part we, of... We, we have the excellent masters, but they don't in England. Um... They have actually, they have a most excellent master degree, but it's part of the Royal and Select Masons Grand Lodge. So if you want to get the Royal Master and the Select Master, you join the cryptic, the Royal and Select Masters Lodge in England. That's but they also for the most excellent master degree, which That's we confer in the Royal Arch. Well, the, the Scottish excellent master is actually rolled into your Royal Arch chapter degree. If okay. it's the same as, as Grand Lodge of California, that, Grand, or, sorry, That's what Grand I'm not New York, sure right? I, I was. Yeah. Well, I was it, on the edge of my understanding, so I was like, "Well, that's it." Seems to, it has the same name, but well, I don't want to. I don't want to go out on a limb and say it is you, exactly the same. If you really want to do the Scottish Excellent Master degree, you have to join the, the Allied Masonic degrees in the states. Ah, okay, and I do belong to that. And, and the group was in nineteen twenty-six. They were given permission to to to, to work the Excellent Master degree, the, the Allied degrees. Okay, uh, Brother Clark, you were saying? Yeah, the cryptic uh, degrees are worked yes. within a separate lodge with it, which is operated by Supreme Grand Royal Arch. Oh, right. So, and when, and the Royal Art Manners uh, as well. Right. Is worked within the Royal uh, the Supreme so, Royal, Grand Royal Arch chapter. In Scotland, if I want to get, if I join the cryptic, what is it called? A cryptic council. Cryptic council. And that's the Royal and Select Master. Are there any other degrees in that? Yeah. What are the other degrees called? Super excellent master. Super excellent, Super excellent master. Uh, okay. I'll have to get the book out. All right. There's another one. <laughs> See, that's not that macro one. yet. I would like to ask all of you when we're done to go and watch the video from last week because I gave a paper on this. The super excellent master degree originated in the US. And I'm kind of curious if it's the same one that. England and Scotland have adopted in their cryptic councils because it's it's an American degree. It was it's own it's younger by far from the um, Royal and Select Master. And in Virginia, I could not receive the super excellent master degree because we don't have a separate council. And I've missed every opportunity when brothers from North Carolina come up and confer the super excellent master degree on any Royal Archmason who wants it. But it's completely separate. It doesn't exist in Virginia which is interesting. I can get it because I'm in the Royal Arch, but it's not conferred here. And I found it interesting that it's in the cryptic councils in the UK. And yes. it's, it's very interesting stuff. But that's all from last week's talk. <laughs> and that's also, that's not in all of the UK. That's right. only in, it's only in Scotland, England, and Wales. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, let me ask a dumb question. What is what is the UK outside of England, Scotland, and Wales? Because I want to make sure I use the right terms. What else is the UK besides those? Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland. Okay. Northern Ireland is, is an odd one. Uh, and the reason I'm saying that is they predominantly work the Irish constitution. Okay. And I, when I say predominantly, that's all that's worked. There are no Scottish constitution lodges in Northern Ireland or in the South in the Republic. Okay. And they... they 
there uh, there is uh, recognition and amity with Grand Lodge of Scotland and also with the Supreme Grand Royal Arts Chapter. But certainly in Ireland, they don't have uh, the cryptic degrees, for example. They don't do the Royal Art Manors. They don't do Lodge and Council. There's a lot of differences with the Irish Constitution versus the Scottish Constitution. Well, and, well and, techni and, techni technically, they do the council part of Lodge and Council because they have the uh, Knight Masons, which is Knight virtually Masons. the same degree. Wow. Yes, although the Knight Masons uh, in, in Ireland have... It's an odd one because uh, they do the second temple and the third temple differently from Scotland. Uh, just we'll get into again, it's um, variation. I, and, and to be clear, I, I hope I don't, I'm not offending anyone when I, when I say UK. As an American, it's like you're all kind of the same island, so I just think of you as one big thing. But yes, I appreciate there's a difference between the UK and the Grand Lodge of England, and I know there's there's probably like ten different terms we could go through. What is England? What is Great Britain? What is the UK? Blah, blah, blah. I understand. It's, and it's important to you the all. The Grand Lodges all go back to prior to the union of right. the Crown. Okay. So there you was have. Ireland, the, Scotland, and England. Right. Wales have, has never been on its own, even though they would like to be. So you have Ireland, the Grand Lodges of Ireland, Scotland, and England. Northern Ireland is part of, or is it its own? Ireland. Grand Lodge? Northern it's Ireland. Of Ireland. It's Ireland. Yeah. The Isle of Ireland. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's all one. Northern Ireland is deemed to be under Grand Lodge Grand of, Lodge Ireland. of Ireland. Of Ireland. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it has been. Politically, yeah. it's not, but Masonically, it is one body. Interesting. Yeah. Yes. yeah the Grand Lodge was there before the political union. Uh, right. Split. Okay. V yeah. And, and stuff. Well, just, just don't get mad at me if I use the wrong term. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Normally, Christopher, everybody calls this these scepter dials England. Right. <laughs> from across the pond. So you're, right. you're doing well. Well, I'm trying to be specific because we are talking about the Grand Lodge of Scotland here, and it is quite different from England. So I do, I'm that's a, what we're exploring. I'm throw Chris under the bus. Yes. Oh, I had no Go ahead. I had no problems with any of that. I understood it all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, that's all right. Well, no, I just simply said UK, and I was corrected. So, all right. But one question I do have, though, is the the idea of the Irish Rite and how uh, its relationship was to Scottish Freemasons. I know that uh, in 1753, the Royal Arch degree was conferred at Fredericksburg, but it was conferred as an uh, it was known as the Irish Rite, but conferred by Scottish officers. And I believe the reason why is because of the War of Austrian Succession, most of the Scottish uh, uh, military was quartered in uh, Ireland to go to the, uh, to the mainland Europe. But uh, is the Irish right, is that something that is uh, tied to, uh, I know it's like more York right than anything else, but is that something that's still in effect in Ireland? And uh, is that something that is known by uh, most Scotsmen um, in the relationship with Ireland? Did I hear that the relationship's pretty close? We wouldn't recognize it as an, a separate right, and you wouldn't hear that type of language here. They have some differences to uh, the, the way that they structure the, the Knight Masons, for example. But uh, it's I don't think uh, the three home grand lodges get as excited about the use of the word right and how we describe things. And uh, it goes back to that time in the 1700s when the... the the British military was all around the place with a lot of Irish soldiers, a lot of Scottish soldiers. And I think it goes back to one of Chris's earlier points about how many uh, Grand Lodges did uh, did come out of the Grand Lodge of Scotland. I think we, we didn't actually look to establish things. And when you look at the, the, the footprint of the three home Grand Lodges, it very much follows the British Empire as was, or the Commonwealth as it is today. And uh, I think Arguably so, and as a, a proud Scottish Freemason, we could claim that anything in North America was Scottish because the first known Freemason in America was a chap called John Skeen, who's a member of uh, Lodge of Aberdeen. And uh, we had the, the Provincial Grand Lodge of North America under Colonel Hope in 1757. Uh, uh, but there was a couple between the ancient and moderns of the United Grand Lodge of England. You said Colonel Young, right? Uh, hope. Oh, okay. Oh no, sorry, John John Young. Yeah, I'm sorry. Young. Right. 
John Young was the provincial uh, grandmaster of four lodges in 1757. My lodge was one of them. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. I, I want just to get extend through. on that as well there, Gordon. Uh, as affiliated to an Irish constitution lodge here, we don't use terms like York right at all. Uh, right. The Irish side of things, there's a couple of uniquenesses there as well. It's very much based on, or sorry, it's different again from the Scottish constitution lodges and from the English constitution, although it does reflect uh, a lot of the English uh, side of things as predominantly through the, uh, the provinces of Ulster, Leinster and Connacht, it's all ruled through Dublin, through the same standard ritual, but in the province of Munster, uh, we have our own ritual down here in Munster, that each lodge is unique in their own workings, very much the same as what Scotland is, and that applies to the arch, also to the knight uh, masons, and also to uh, other orders that are associated with that. It's, it's where the, we don't recognise an awful lot of the terms, we base uh, the Grand Lodge of Scotland and the Grand Lodge of Ireland, there is amnity between the two of them. So it's really just understanding that what we do in one yeah, is similar, but not the same. What, um, what I would like is if some of my brothers, some of you would be able to reach out to some Irish Masons. I would love to do this another time and interview some people from the Grand Lodge of Ireland and ask similar questions so we can explore that. I'll be well. glad to help you on that one, Chris. If y'all can help put that together, that'd be yeah, wonderful. Glad to help. Okay, moving back back to our questions. <laughs> um, da, 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 da. Oh, uh, Brother Gordon, is there more than one volume of sacred law displayed on the altar? There can be. Okay. But I would say generally in a, a Scottish lodge, you will probably only see uh, the King James Bible. I... The, the Christian volume of the sacred law. However, uh, if you have a, a joining member of another faith, it is quite right and important that they take their obligations on the holy book of their choice. Uh, but I, on a, in my province, I've only seen in two or three lodges. Uh, but again, it's a, it's a choice to that brother of whatever faith, what, if he's comfortable taking it on uh, the, the lodges uh, volume of the sacred law which would tend to be the, the Christian volume. Okay. Um, Brother Scott, where are the candle, the three candles placed near the altar? Are they placed around the altar? Or are they on the altar? Um, we don't use us. We're not quite the same uh, in that ah. respect. We, we okay. have, um, we do have what we call the three lesser lights. Yes, um, that's what I'm referring to. I believe is probably the, the closest equivalent. Um, but they wouldn't be in my, certainly in my mother lodge or any of the lodges I've been to, they tend to be displayed uh, sort of behind the master on the, on the wall. Um, we wouldn't place them on the floor as I know happens in, in certain, uh, Interesting. certain American lodges. Okay. And is that the same across all of Scotland then, since we seem to have some I think they, they would also be on the warden's dais, so the master and Ooh. the two wardens would have their lights. Okay. None of you, okay, because we put them on the floor... It yeah. does vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but like in Virginia, it's if you're look if you're standing at the altar facing the master, so you're on the side where the kneeling pad is, they are top left, top right, and bottom left, and they're Thank in you. that order: the sun, moon, and worshipful master for the master, senior warden, junior warden. Mm -hmm. I think the only lodge I've seen them on the floor on the Mary's floor, Chapel. It's Mary's Chapel. Interesting. Okay. Well, there you and go. And arguably, they are the oldest. Uh, yes, so they, they're doing it right. So uh. that's right. All of somehow you all took a wrong turn, but that's okay. Yeah, <laughs> we, couldn't have, we couldn't afford the big candle holders. That's what it is. Yeah. And by the way, uh, I another you. another throwback to uh, another promo for another one of our um, um, videos. One of our previous meetings, we talked about traditional observance lodges, which is a phenomenon here in the U.S. where they're trying to go back to their roots, in effect. And uh, they insist on using actual candles. Uh, when I was in D. Malay, which is one of our youth groups, um, we had seven candles around the altar, and they're literally candles. At some point, we became just electric lights. And all of the blue, all of, every lodge I've ever been in, every one, they use electric lights. They do not actually use candles anymore, I think because of uh, 
worrying about fire codes and what all. But to me, I'd much rather <coughs> have candles lit than, than electric lights. But that's just me. Um, brother, let's see, go down the list here. Brother Sloan, um, what are some of the working tools in the um, in the sky? Yeah, you're good. Since you've seen both um, in Scottish masonry, are the working tools the same as what American Grand Lodges would use? Uh, no, I think the only difference is the uh, skirt in the third degree. Okay. And what's a skirt? An instrument acting on a center pin from whence a line is drawn to mark out the intended ground plan of the structure. But I, I, it's, I've certainly in the Grand Lodge of the Philippines, I've never seen, seen okay. that. And they're from the Grand Lodge of California. Interesting. So the plumb square and level, the tri, uh, let's see, plumb square and level, uh, the, co set, uh, the common gavel, 24 inch gauge, and the trout. Yeah. So nothing beyond, the, it, pretty much the same, except you have the skirt in addition to that. Is that correct? Anybody else got any other working tools that nobody else has? No, yeah, we're, we're, we're missing the two other third degree ones, and I can't think what they are. Pencil? Pencil and the... Uh, um, Compass. I, sh I shouldn't have. Compass. Yeah, I shouldn't have. I've done, I've done the lecture often enough. Okay. Interesting. All right. Um, we don't use a trowel. What's that? We, we don't use a trowel. We don't use a trowel. Okay. Right. We use the trowel to spread the cement of brotherly love and affection. One of my favorites. <laughs> from the Master Mason's degree. Okay. Uh, Brother Gavin. Um, oh, this is a good one. Do you know any, okay, how many of the ancient landmarks would you say? Does Scotland have an official list of ancient landmarks? There's a skirt. Sorry, just to point out there, uh, yes. there's a skirt for you on uh, Walter Richardson's that's a skirt. Oh, okay. It's a, it's a pro proper sized one as well. Hmm. <laughs> you what can spot that? the joiner. Okay. <laughs> I'll have to go Google what that is then so I understand because I've never seen that. Um, Used in the garden regularly. Oh, okay. There would be a, there would be a string on it. Uh -huh. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. that, and so you'd... You mark out the structure by running a Oh, line. Uh, a plumb, a, uh, well. Not a plumb line. It's not a, a plumb line. It's a. Um, it's a marker to line out perimeter. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're putting a foundation and you know. Chalk yeah. line. Chalk yeah. line we would yeah. have. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. I, I think Florida has a chalk line in their ritual. Someone told me about that. I've actually used chalk lines. Okay. There's an interesting joke that was played on me. Um, uh -huh. Not, not during an actual degree, but at one of the rehearsals when I was fairly new to floor working and I was doing the working tools and I had the skirt in hand and you're taught, you know, the, the line is drawn out um, and, you, you know, physically act it out and it's always tied so that when you pull the, the string, right. it doesn't unravel. Um, but one of the jokes that's commonly played on the, the newest floor worker is to take out the knot on the, the, the skirt so that when they pull it, the entire thing comes out and then you've got to make them stand there and tie it all back up again. <laughs> That's, they, they got me quite uh, they got me quite quite well with that one. All right. Uh, anyway, going back to uh, Gavin, um, yeah, I was asking what, do you know any of the ancient <laughs> landmarks and does Scotland um, iterate them? Are they written down? Are they talked about any? <laughs> yeah, they... <sighs> It's more, I've only found this out from my own readings uh, as such, but the landmarks as such are passed on, not specifically as a list, mm -hmm. but they're more communicated as you go through uh, various degrees. So, for example, uh, the entitlement of every master mason to sit in a lodge. Well, that, mm -hmm. that's all well and good, but you can't be, as everyone is aware, can't be an entered apprentice sitting in on a fellow craft degree. You're asked to retire. So you're actually made aware of them as you go through, but they're not explicitly, certainly in Karen, they're not explicitly spelled out as a list okay. to say you should know this, you should know that, you should know the other thing. It is encouraged that you go and find them for yourself, but certainly it's not something that's spelled out. Pretty good. Okay. Does anyone know if the, if the Grand Lodge of Scotland has 
made the effort to record all of the agent land, which no, you can the, see the, the landmarks. No. The Grand Lodge of Scotland recently issued a statement about four or five years ago uh, about what we believe are the ancient landmarks. I will get the, the, the paper for you, Christopher, and send it over to you. you. But they don't recognise uh, what Mackie would say were his 23 or so ancient landmarks because it's all part of the work that we do. Uh, right. There are things, but we, the Grand Lodge of Scotland won't uh, describe or write down what they class as the, the ancient landmarks. But it's a, it's a good paper. I'll send it to you. Yeah, uh, it's good. not for uh, non-Masonic eyes, obviously, but for your lodge. Right. Uh, more than happy to share that with you. Okay. I would yeah. definitely love to get that too. Yeah. Um, okay, Brother Rintoul, um, who are some famous Scottish Masons? Apart from the ones attending this meeting. Yes, I know, I know. Not, <laughs> famous outside uh, of this meeting, perhaps. Outside of this meeting. Uh, I don't know, like Robert the Bruce or something, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there, there's quite a few. None spring to mind, apart from the one being flashed. Robert, Robert Burns. Burns. Yes. Yes. Robert Burns is probably the most famous Scottish right. Freemason. Okay. And we obviously still celebrate him, his life every year. Um, Interesting. Okay. George Washington. Hey, David, David, can I help you out? Because I've got uh, Bob Cooper's book here, Famous <laughs> Scottish go. Freemasons, All right, that is available <laughs> from the Grand Lodge of Scotland uh, <laughs> website uh, yeah. for the princely okay. sum of £20. It, it'll be linked uh, in the chat so you can purchase it later. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, arts and sciences, uh, names that you may, uh, oh, let's see, Boswell, Burness, Burns, Burrow, uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, Sir Alexander yeah. Fleming, uh, Michael Kemp, uh, Industry, uh, Sir Thomas Lipton of Tea Frame, uh, McAdam, uh, a huge list of uh, Victoria Cross holders, Bruce uh, Burton, uh, Field Marshal Errol Haig, through my lodge, is mm. named after. Uh, Jock Steen, the football player. Uh, Jock Wallace, the footballer manager. Uh, <laughs> a huge amount. Uh, Sir Harry Lauder, Jimmy Logan. Uh, and again, more and more uh, how about, how information about is coming out. How about Scottish actors that I would know? Oh... Sean Connery is not, as many people said he was, is like he was not. <laughs> so, ent sports and entertainment. Uh, William Schwenk Gilbert, uh, Sir George Goldie Graham, Sir Harry Lauder, Jimmy Logan, Jackie Patterson, Sir Jimmy Shand, Jock Steen, Willie Thornton, Jock Wallace. That's footballing at the end of it. Uh, but. I uh, know. <laughs> no, that's, that, that's the challenge. And I don't think right. nowadays. Uh, the good and the great aren't joining the fraternity as much as they did in the past. Right. Well, I, I think I'll go out on a limb and say I think Sean Connery is probably your most famous Scotsman. But... <laughs> the most famous Scottish Freemason, certainly from the American side, is George Washington, is he not? That's right. Very true. Very true. That's right. <laughs> but you guys should also learn about Gen uh, General Hugh Mercer. Uh, he is very important to the American story. And yet nobody knows about him. And he was uh, a renowned for, for his Scottish accent, as well as uh, uh, being part of the uh, Battle of Culloden Moor. And arguably, sure. uh, Washington wasn't a Scottish Freemason at the time because he was uh, the lodge wasn't recognized as initiation by the Grand Lodge of Scotland. That just came on uh, later on because it was clandestine at the time. Right. I heard about that. Not really. What we're, the, the, the evidence that we're, we're searching for is the fact that Scottish officers actually uh, obtained a had an, a warrant from an army lodge with the Constitution from Ireland. But uh, the they already had made the arrangements with Scotland that uh, they would uh, get a procure a charter from them as first chance. <coughs> uh, let's see, your your other famous military man was John Paul Jones. Ah, there you go. Yeah, very true. All right. Uh, Brother Keegan and Brother Dillett have both dropped, I think. Um, so Brother Taggart is next in the list. Um, do you have meals or snacks before or after your meetings? Uh, after a regular meeting, it's a pie and a pint. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and a raffle. 
<laughs> got, you can't forget about the raffle. So I apply a pint. It's just very informal after regular meetings. If it's our installation, obviously we'll sit down and have a meal. Okay. Um, but th that's that's us. Uh, sorry, that's Broxburn personally. I mean, there's lodges in Edinburgh that so, we've been to. The, the, well, their harmony and the meals are more important than the ritual. I'll probably get hung for saying that, but. Well, now, again, so let, me question, <laughs> let me ask the question then. When does your meeting? When do your meetings typically start? We we start at seven o'clock, first and third okay. Thursday of the month. So right. we're so usually you, done. Depending so on the, it'd be a late dinner at eight thirty or whenever, however long your lunch meeting was. You don't typically no, eat before I, then. I, I, everybody I, everybody I, will probably have to eat before. If the it was put about a third, it'd be eleven o'clock. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that's what I was getting at because we typically serve dinner before a meeting, so it's not typical then to serve dinner before your meeting. No, no, no. I think what's happened as well. You've got to understand that the with society changing, guys working day shift, back shift, night shift. The, there's less. So, well, I'm not going to say all, but less emphasis on the harmony meal wise afterwards. A lot of guys, a lot of guys maybe have to go and do a night shift. A lot of guys. Of ah, just off okay. a, a day shift, so that way is probably one of the biggest changes, probably f through the years. Eh? Okay. Um, do you have? Uh, let's see. Go on to the next one, uh, Brother Clark. Do you have social occasions at the lodge outside of your meetings? Do you have social occasions at the lodge, like where wives get invited to, what have you, or anything? Yeah, we have uh, your disco now and again, karaoke night. Okay. Know? Things like that, yeah. Very good. Uh, like uh, potlucks or picnics or anything like that? Is that typical? No. No? Okay. No. Are, is, are potlucks... It was years ago. Year, years and years ago. Because I, no. I, 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 Let me ask a question because I don't know. Are potlucks common in Scotland? Are you calling no. them something else? Where everyone brings a dish? No. 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 Really? But, but picnic, yeah, I mean, I mean, not in masonry. I'm saying in Scotland in general, for any reason. No, no. Seriously, potlucks are not a thing. Is no. that pretty much an American invention? I guess it I must know. be. If we, if if someone's putting a function on, they put the food on. They don't expect somebody to bring it. Okay. Well, that's I worked with the U.S. Thing. I worked with the U.S. Navy for about five, six years when I was first in the, the Air Force, and they were huge on potlucks. Every weekend there was a potluck. And I had never heard this phrase before. And right. nobody told nobody told me that the idea was you had to bring something with you. So I would turn up with alcohol, uh, ah. no no food, and yeah, everyone they... would look at me really bizarre. And I'm thinking, well, no, I, I had never heard this phrase before until I worked with the U.S. Navy. <laughs> You'd either be shunned or welcomed. I think with the U.S. Navy, you'd be welcome. It's like, oh, somebody brought some booze. Well, Thank God. Hot luck in Scotland was a, a TV show where they played snooker. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, then. Um, to see, Brother uh, Dale, do you have co masonry in Scotland? Females and lodges? Uh, mixed. Well, uh, I know there's, there's female lodges exist in Scotland. I'm not sure about co masonry, but it certainly okay. exists in England. Uh, but I, I've never experienced or had any contact with it. I just know that it, it exists. I know where they meet. Okay, because I know there is, the, I know it's big in France, and the Grand Lodge of England has sort of a tortured statement saying, "Well, okay, you're really not regular, but we kind of recognize that you exist, but you know, we're not going to yeah. recognize you." But <laughs> I think we similar we, to say you're not a, regular, but they won't. <laughs> we have a friend who is a past master of a ladies' lodge of Freemasons in Glasgow. Interesting. Okay, okay. So they do, but of course, they're not recognized by. Um, your Grand Lodge? No. Okay. All right. We've got um, Eastern Star. What's that? We have the Order of Eastern Star. Yes, which is which is absolutely not the same thing, but everyone seems to get their confused for some reason. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Eastern Star is very much a a, pen, a a ladies organization that was actually created in the U.S. for um, for the wives of the Masons to join and have something to be involved in. In most states men can join the Eastern Star as well, and couples tend to join them. My wife and I belong. We never go, but we do belong. In Pennsylvania, 
Masons are not allowed in Eastern Star. It's completely a ladies' organization. They don't want Masons at all. But of course, totally heard separate thing from Jersey Masons. Uh, Masons. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, Brother Gordon again. Um, okay. I, I'm trying to find a way to put this delicately, but obviously in America, we had an issue with Prince Hall and a separation and blacks and whites not sitting in lodge together. Is there, are men of every race and religion welcome in Scottish masonry? Has there ever been a contention? Is there any kind of a bias that you've had in your past where some people weren't welcome? No, I would say that as long as you believe in the Supreme Being, uh, there are no issues at all. Uh, the, you just have to look at the demographic of the nation, however, well, yes. to look at the predominance that it will be uh, Caucasians that are you're generally meeting with, but there is nothing stopping anyone from any other race, religion, or creed joining as long as they've got that belief. Uh, we do not have the the issues that I think I think I just read last week that you're now down to six uh, state grand lodges yes. waiting to recognise Prince Hall affiliates. Uh, that's never been there, and we've got on record uh, people like a. Uh, Jackie Johnson, the boxer, was uh, initiated, uh, but then uh, that had his, his membership was suspended because of a complaint from America at the time. Uh, and there's there's a, a paper on that on uh, one of the Masonic blogs as well. Uh, but no, I, I would say that we don't have uh, similar related issues at all. Okay. Okay, that's good. So, is it typical? I mean, I would say that. Well, I'm trying to think. Scotland is Scotland predominantly Catholic or Protestant? Would you say? I, I would. The majority of Scots would be from the Church of Scotland, Presbyterian. Sure. Okay, uh, but okay. there is there is a, a good predominance, more so in the west of the country, uh, of a, a Roman Catholic, but a, a population. But we've also got Episcopalian uh, that comes from the the, the Anglican community as well, so, uh, and uh, but the the. the the state church is the Church of Scotland, which is a, right. a Presbyterian uh, church. So predominantly Scottish Masons would be Christian then, either Catholic or Protestant? I would suggest pr primarily a Christian, Presbyterian, Protestant. Right. Uh, okay. But with a, a good sprinkling of uh, Roman Catholics. But again, that comes back to their interpretation of the various bills that have been published from the Vatican. Right, uh, right. I wanna, I don't and wanna, we, we we've got a couple of <laughs> yeah. And there's a couple of there's a, a couple of predominantly Jewish uh, lodges. And uh, sure, this is the sure. start of Passover today. Uh, so Sham Yamach to uh, any Jewish brand watching this. Uh, and so you've got in the big towns, Glasgow and Edinburgh, do have their, their uh, respective uh, lodges that are pre predominantly for for Jewish brethren. Uh, but you you have uh, with I know Muslim brethren, I know Hindu brethren, I know Jewish brethren, uh, okay, I know uh, Roman good. Catholic brethren. So basically, it's 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 more the demographic of the area more than anything else. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Typical here for America, actually, is and and thankfully we are overcoming our our, our racial issues that from two centuries ago that we have to bear the cross today. We're trying to get out of, but yeah, we, we certainly masonry, as I understand it, welcomes a man of any, any, any color, any religion. It's that's the whole point is any man who believes in the spring bean, but you know, America has this stain that we're trying to dig out from under that gets flung at our face from those who, you know, don't care for us, but uh, well, that's good. Okay. So it's not really an issue there. I, I guess I'm sure it is. You hear a Prince hall and what we go through here, it's like, why, why is that even a problem? But, it's from the past. It's not us, but we inherited it. We're trying to get over it. Um, so, and of course, um, all of you speak wonderful English with wonderful accents. <laughs> Do you can, uh, let me, uh, sorry, Brother Scott, are your business meetings conducted in English? Is there Scottish spoken in your meetings? Oh, well, yes. <laughs> I mean, um, I don't even know. And again, <laughs> I mean, you all probably speak perfectly fine <clears throat> English, and I don't know if Scottish is even considered. I mean, you know, there's more. Yeah, so there's the, the, and again, for me, give my ignorance. And, <coughs> I'm trying to be delicate and bring this up. Yeah, yeah uh -huh. it's appreciated. Um, we, it would be what is mainly recognised as being English. Okay. Um, the certainly, 
we are, as Freemasons, traditionalists, so there's a lot of old language, <coughs> and it would be, um, some of the words would be considered old Scots. Okay. Um, I have seen a couple of aprons and things that have been presented in proper, full-on old Scots language, right. and it's, I, w I don't know if it's commonplace, but it's certainly impressive to watch, um, okay. particularly when you have seen the, the, the more traditional elements of it, um, to see it done in, in old Scots language. And for brethren that are not familiar with what that is, just think of Robert Burns. Right. So the way well, Robert and again, Burns. this is where I, I, I step in it, but I'm not afraid. It's the, I, I'm happy to say something that's totally inappropriate and I'll get laughed at or scolded, but that's just me. So Scottish as a language is pretty much not a thing. I mean, the Irish, I'm trying to think of like, the Irish have Gaelic and some speak, and it wouldn't be recognizable as English, so it can be considered a separate language. So really, Scottish is not, you would not consider any kind of Scottish as basically being a separate language. You say Old Scots would sound more like Old English and just sound- Is it not Gaelic? Different. Huh? No, we, we, we've got, there is Scots Gaelic, that is recognised, okay. and a right. uh, Scots itself is now a recognised language of the the Scottish government, as well as all the other languages that are coming into the country. With uh, that's happened over the past years or so. So Polish, uh, Hindu, Urdu, uh, Chinese, uh, Mandarin, that sort of stuff. But for us, and then you've got your local dialects. Uh, we're all very much speaking posh and politely for. Uh, for this presentation <laughs> to our American yes. realm. But if Kevin and I were to, to drop into Fifees and a uh, Broxburn speak, you wouldn't hear a clue what we're saying because we're going that fast and it's all we words that we can what's all about. Uh, and then you've got the Doric up north and fit like Quine uh, and things like that. You just wouldn't hear a clue what we were saying. Okay. So I think we've so, slowed our speech down uh, to okay. pronunciate better to allow you and your, your uh, viewers to understand us going forward. And we appreciate it. <laughs> so then, say it's not, it's not that it's, okay, I'm trying to find a way to put, to summarize this and bring it all down. So Scottish is not a separate language per se, but you would be able to talk faster and have throw in other words that I'd be lost. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But in your meetings, you use English. I mean, you speak English, much like we're all speaking here. Yeah, that, that's the language of the country. English is the recognised language. Correct. Okay. Uh, for, further to that as well, though, this is something that uh, happens on occasion is that we'll have a, a visiting uh, conferring of what would be called the old degrees. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've not been fortunate enough to see this. I know my dad has been very fortunate to see this, where uh, one of the Cowinning Lodge, I'm not sure if it was Mother Cowinning, actually goes around and confers a degree in full 17th century language and in full 17th century garb as well, including wow. top socks and whatnot. And cool. that's a unique experience from what I've been told. I've never had the pleasure in seeing it. Okay. Well, okay. So Gordon, when you say, when you all talk, if, if you weren't being polite and speaking slowly for me, would you say you're still speaking English or would you consider yeah. that old Scots? Okay. Yeah. It's, it's just we, we, every area in Scotland's got its own words for different things. Okay. And yeah. uh, some, some will be more guttural. If you go to the Highlands and Islands, they, they start singing to you and their, their voice and their pitch is a lot higher. Right. See. So again, it's just different places across the country well, have us, different accents, just in the same way that you've that. got your, your New York accent is different right. to your Virginia accent. Well, just for the heck of it, your Boston give accent. Little, give me a little example of that. <laughs> just so I know what you're uh, saying. Uh, uh, the, the one that I've got in my head, I'll get her out. Uh, well, I wouldn't care what you say about that, you know. Uh, Shahu, I'm Fikelwe. <laughs> Fikelwe, well, that says it all, then, eh? Uh, <laughs> okay, see? I kind of followed, but okay, good. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. Um, so give you, um, I, can give you, I can give you an example of a young teacher uh -huh. <clears throat> who'd been sent on teaching practice out to uh, Aberdeenshire and the, she was talking about Easter and the crucifixion and she asked the kids how, how did the Easter happen and uh, what happened to Christ at Easter time and the kids just sat and looked and looked and hadn't a clue what she was saying until an assistant came in and she said, I'm not getting anywhere. I've asked them, how did Christ die? And they said, oh, no, it's all right. She said, 
What come about the good Lord at the hinner end? Did you get that? I didn't get that, I'm sorry. <laughs> what come about the good Lord at the hinner end? What happened to Christ when he died? Okay. <laughs> at the end of his life. I think Brother Joyner had to drop and Oh, no, you still there, Brother Joyner? I think you're frozen. <laughs> yeah, Brother Joyner was chatting with me. Um, sorry. Oh, Brother Joyner is rebooting. Yep, okay. All righty then. Um, Let's see, coming back and, uh, okay, um, Brother Taggart, are men of every class welcome in Scottish lodges? In your lodge, in other lodges, you, you love working men, professionals? Sorry, I missed the first bit, Chris. Uh, in your lodge, are, are what <coughs> class of men typically join and attend? Is it every kind, blue collar, professionals? Uh. Or no, it's, it's a, it's, I would probably say in most lodges it's it's a wide variation. Um, okay, it is. Okay, it is, I, we, I think that's a beauty of it as well. I mean, I have been lucky enough to be in places, other places throughout the world where, um, and under Scottish constitution, Freemasonry, where it's not been exactly the same. But I would probably go along the lines. I think that's a beauty of Freemasonry in Scotland. Yes along the lines of what we get, um, our initiation fees, and especially our test fees. So I, I would generally say in Scotland, Freemasonry is, I think should be very proud of being a working, a working man's craft, to be honest. It's, uh, it's a lot cheaper than going to a golf club, let me put it that way. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. So it is, I mean, that, I, I agree is what it should be, but you don't understand that I ask these same sort of questions whatever grand jurisdiction we're talking to, like in some places only the well-off can afford, only a successful I, I, I've been in places in the world where that's been. And I think, yep. um, I think as well, I might be wrong here, maybe the other guys might tell me, but I mean, for talking say, if you go down to England and they have dining fees and they're extravagant and we don't, yes. I, I've, no, I've not been in any lodges in Scotland that I've came across with that yet. I mean, right. You, you obviously maybe pay a couple of pound or whatever if you're having a, a, a wee harmony at the end, but like I say, I think some other other places, other constitutions concentrate more on after the meeting than during mm -hmm. it. Yep. All right. Uh, Brother Clark, are, do you have cigars? Do you have smoking in your lodge or during the meetings, after the meetings, before the meetings? You can, you, you can smoke in the bus shelter. Mm -hmm. But you can't smoke in any building in Scotland anymore. Okay. Um, I know, but we, we would have probably had cigars after uh, dining at the installation back in, the, I think, the first time I went through the chair, we had cigars. Uh, but the law changed not long after that, so. Okay. You know, you, so for any of you all, is, is, is there, is smoking a custom at all, like outside the lodge room, you know, like outside the building or anything? When I said the, when I said the bus shelter, I meant because the bus shelter is outside the lodge room. Right. Uh, okay. But, I understand. <laughs> so that's not, that's not customary at all then. Okay. No, uh, smoking, smoking isn't permitted inside any enclosed space, any right. buildings in Scotland. Uh, and as a, an ex-smoker as well, many years ago, yeah, it was, you could have uh, cigars or cigarettes or pipes even uh, in uh, the lodge after meetings. It was never part mm. of the meetings as such, uh, but certainly at the Harmony, it was always there. But the rooms were you know, chock full of smoke and these days it's much nicer. And if anyone does want to smoke, then please feel free to step outside and go in the, in the air. Right, okay. And well, historically, Christopher, yeah. when, uh, if you were sitting down for the meal and you were having toast, which would normally be at the installation, you would have the, the toast to the queen uh, and the craft and the master would say, Bern, you can now smoke. Mm, smoke. So you, you didn't smoke until the toast to the queen and the craft happen. Okay. Uh, and yes. that's when people will, will run down the stairs and go to the proverbial bus stop now for their right. uh, <laughs> quick puff of the nicotine. What's customary, like my lodge, Ocean View, 
has um, a number of us who are cigar <clears throat> smokers. I mean, as you can probably tell from my um, my background, um, <laughs> I enjoy cigars myself. And we do smoke out occasion in the lodge, in the dining hall. Usually we'll go outside, depending on how big a crowd there is, you know, out of, out of courtesy. But typically after our meeting, when most people have filtered out, several of us light up cigars and we sit there for hours afterwards and sit and, and chat. And that's a big thing for us. Um, Brother Walter, um, do you serve alcohol? Are you allowed to serve alcohol during <laughs> lodge functions, after lodge functions, what have you? What's the custom? What's the rule there? The bar is usually open before the meeting. Okay. Closed during the meeting and opens after. And uh, as say, has been already said, your pie and your pint uh, is quite common. And also, uh, we do tea, coffees, and sandwiches, but right. the bar is open. Now, to is open the bar. bar run by the lodge, or is that a separate, how does that, when you say the no. bar? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, that's a difficult one, because the, uh, as a lodge, we're not allowed to have a bar. So the bar, I think, and I can be corrected in this, is a separate organization within different accounting to but it's in uh, the building it's always yes. i mean it's in your masonic temple it's in the building yes okay. on the ground floor, and okay. it was refurbished just uh, about oh maybe 10 years ago and uh, because it was a very old narrow uh, room that the bar was in and they uh, trebled the size of it and it's a much more hospitable a bar area and lounge that we have now and yes and they contribute to lodge funds regularly right. excellent okay so is that typical then for most of y'all then that you'd have a you'd actually have a bar if you wanted alcohol before or after a meeting okay wow. <laughs> so civilized in virginia <laughs> We, we, it's a, we it's better than smoking cigars. Well, <laughs> I love to do both. And that's why I like going to Scottish Rite conferences because I can drink and I can smoke my cigar and I can be surrounded by my Masonic brothers. So I get a trifecta. I can do, <laughs> I can do two of them at home. I can do two of them in my blue lot. See, like if I'm at home, I can smoke a cigar and I can have a drink, but I'm alone. If I go to my blue lodge, I can have a cigar and be around my Masonic brothers, but I can't drink alcohol. I can go to a local bar but I can't smoke or be around my brother. So if I, the only way I get all three together is the Scottish Rite when we have our conferences. <laughs> or, you no, know, we, unless I have a party at my house or something. Into the country. What's that? We retire up into the country. Since you can't have uh, alcohol at Lodge, right? go to some local place that has an open area where you can smoke and eat and drink, and we call it retiring up into the country. That would be outstanding. <laughs> so that's what we do. Uh, the other thing is, is that the Grand Commandery of Knights Templars have the Order of the Leaf. Which ah, yes. Part, you should be part of. <laughs> we, we do have a spinoff in the DMLA. Um, brother, uh, let's see, who's next here? Brother Scott, um, do you have youth group? Oh, wait. Well, you might know. Uh, are there youth groups associated in, in Scotland? DMLA, Job's Daughters, Rainbow, youth groups sponsored by the Masons? Not that I'm aware of. Um, I am aware because uh, I have a good friend that's, and, a, and a brother that's a member of our lodge who came from England, who went to a Masonic school uh, in England, but I don't think we have an equivalent in Scotland, not that I'm right. aware of. And it, do not have, okay. Well, you need to have youth groups, dang it. All right. <laughs> I was, you, you all, I assume you all are at least familiar with them. You've heard of them? Like DMLA, okay. Yeah. I was in DMLA myself. This is what brought me into masonry. Um, so I've been a big supporter of the youth groups forever. So I think it's important to us and it's, it, they're in most countries now, but I've noticed like England does not permit them. Apparently Scotland doesn't. I think we've, we've got a tradition of the, the, the scout movement and the boys brigade yes. movement yep. that at times are seen as places that you can uh, find uh, young men that are interested and have got the sort of the moral right. fiber that would attract them well, to join in the craft. But we don't have any dedicated Masonic youth associations as, as a good researcher i should remember the man's name i can't think of it but the fellow who started the boy scouts ben uh, was, ben was, ben was it ben what's Powell. his name Baden Powell. yeah he uh he was a mason no he wasn't and no he wasn't, he was. he wasn't. Nope. no he was 
He okay. was very friendly with many Masons, and okay. there is an argument that uh, a lot of his uh, thoughts of, of how the Boy Scout movement should be formed would be formed along Masonic principles, but he actually never joined. Oh, uh, but a lot of his uh, military peers from the Boer War that he served with were uh, Freemasons. Oh, okay. Well, and there's a very good presentation, Chris, on the Lodge Hope of Karachi uh, Facebook pages that you can see uh, scouting and Freemasonry by Brother Tony Harvey, uh, mm -hmm. two parallel organisations, and he goes into the, the similarities in quite oh, a, cool. I'll a check that out. depth. Well, uh, I, 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 another I urban the, legend that yeah. shot down, because I was not understanding he was. I put the link in the in the chat. For Thank that, you. For um, but channel. just to clarify the difference, I mean, the, the Scouts are a, not a Masonic organisation. There are plenty of Blue Lodges that support their local Scout chapters. Our Scottish Rite does, but uh, specifically, Demolay, Jovies, and Rainbow were founded as Masonic youth groups, and they are structured that they must be sponsored by a Blue Lodge. And they continue to exist because of Masons and Eastern Star, what all that uh, support them and keep them alive. So they are very much a part of us, unlike the Boy Scouts. A, a Rainbow Assemblage must have a, a Rainbow Dad who must be a Mason yep. Yep. attend at every meeting. Yep. Okay. Um, is there a, pri let's see, Brother uh, Taggart, is there a primary charity of the Grand Lodge of Scotland or do individual lodges have their own charities or how does that? Uh, it's a bit of a mixture. The Grand Lodge of Scotland chooses a, a, a sort of charity. Um, they were doing one for Prostate Scotland. I can't remember the one before it. Um, okay. So they uh, choose that, one they promote. So for a given Grand Master, we'll have a... Well, I, 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 I'm not very really sure how, how the actual Grand Lodge chooses the okay. sort of chosen charity, but for daughter lodges um, like ourselves, uh, we've we've actually been very lucky recently that, that we've done a lot of charity work since the COVID started. Um, we were able to choose who we decide to give okay. either money or food, but just recently... Um, as a daughter lodge, in, in the last 10, 9, 10 months, we've donated over half a million pounds um, throughout Scotland. And what we've got a chance to do is um, work with guys uh, in other provinces like Gordon, um, Edinburgh, Inverness. Um, through being fortunate ourselves, we wanted to spread it as far and wide as possible as we could in Scotland. And it, it's, it's a thing that it brings us all together. It brings the provinces together. It brings the guys together. Um, and also in this time of need, through the COVID-19 throughout the world, but everybody's suffering, everybody's... I think it's just going to get worse, but we'll wait and see what happens. But as a Grand Lodge charity, um, I can't remind who God, uh, Gordon, I can't remind who Grand Lodge had before Prostate Scotland. Chaz, the, the Chaz. way that the Grand Lodge of Scotland choose it, there is a Benevolence and Care Committee, which is one of the official subcommittees of the Grand Lodge of Scotland. That's chaired by our past Grand Master Mason, Marcus Humphrey of Dunnett. And uh, charities are able to make application uh, to the Grand Lodge of Scotland. And that committee will consider, uh, should they take them on as an official charity or give a donation from uh, whatever fund is appropriate. Uh, but the last five years, I think six years, has been Prostate Scotland and again that ties in with the membership because I, many of our brethren have faced uh, difficulties from that disease and again many of us I have the, well, we've all got the potential of uh, succumbing to that disease so they do try to align themselves with organisations that uh, have got an affinity to uh, the membership base. Right, thank well, you. We, what we also do as well Chris we've just recently been donating but in Scotland, they have two Masonic care homes, um, mm. which is obviously run through the char as charities and through Grand Lodge as well. So to try and donate as much to them as possible, just basically help keep the bills down um, and keeping the pennies going. But ultimately, daughter lodges choose who they want to give charity to. Very good. And um, Grand Lodge has supported uh, Poppy Scotland as well over the last few years. I can't remember, Gordon might be able to tell us the amount of money that the... the given to Poppy Scotland? I think 
direct money that we can attribute to the Grand Lodge of Scotland uh, through the Masonic Crosses at Remembrance time every year is in the region of 120, 130,000 pounds. But what we can attribute is the, the tens of thousands of man hours and individual donations to the Poppy Appeal since uh, the Poppy Appeal Scotland was formed. Uh, Brother Errol Haig was a Freemason. <laughs> And uh, we look at the, I do a presentation, Chris, on remembrance in Freemasonry. And I'm a great believer that uh, Errol Haig founded the Legion movement on Masonic principles uh, as well. So I, I, I really believe that, again, and that remembrance in Canada and America came from similar discussions. Uh, so I do believe it's got that Masonic entity behind it. Uh, but again, it's... And the, last year, uh, the, the Grand Master Mason, Ramsey McGee, was awarded our President's Award from Poppy Scotland. It's our highest award that we can give. And he's been a long-term volunteer in the Black Isle, where he comes from, and has raised tens of thousands of pounds, personally, with his volunteer network there. So it's, uh, I would say, millions of pounds that the, the Masonic community has raised for, for the Poppy Appeal uh, in the UK over the last 100 years. Right. Um, I do want to point out something you mentioned um, in passing there. And I got in a discussion with, I think, you and a couple other guys uh, on one of the Facebook groups is um, the title of your Grandmaster is Grandmaster Mason, which is, I find interesting because here in Virginia, you're the Grandmaster. There are Master Masons. We're all Master Masons once we serve the, the Master Mason's degree. But he's the Grand Master, just like he's the Worshipful Master. But you actually, the title for your Grand Master is Grand Master Mason. I just find that a little bit interesting. I was, I was, I was trying to almost correct the brother. Are you sure that's the correct title? Because certainly we don't put that in there. There are Master Masons and there are Grand Masters, and they are not the same thing, although one is the other. But Grand Master Mason is part of his title, which is interesting. Now that's. I don't know if it's only in Scotland, but that's certainly different from our American experience. It's just Grand Master is the title. Grand Master of Masons is his full title, but not Grand Master. Christopher, just picking up on something that Gordon mentioned there about the um, El Hague and the, the sort of founding principles with, around Legion, or Royal British Legion, Legion Scotland. I'm the chairperson for our local branch of Legion Scotland here in Millport. And what's quite interesting is obviously having uh, affiliation with both the, the Lodge and the, the Legion. If you put our membership together and obviously took out the, the, the female members of the British Legion and looked at them, they'd be almost identical. Um, two organisations, one's obviously more aimed towards veterans and things, but the, the actual membership of both these organisations is very similar. We have the, 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 the added fact that we're a small island, so naturally we only have a small pool of people, but I think it's very common across Scotland that the, the membership of these organisations is very similar. Very good, cool. And out of interest, Errol Haig's wife, uh, Lady Dorothy Haig, who founded the Poppy Factory in Scotland, she was a Lady Freemason. Ah. <laughs> okay then. Uh, Brother Gavin, do you wear, do you, not just you, of course, do you wear Masonic rings or lapel pins or other things in public? Hats, anything, anything with the square and compass? Uh, yes, uh, I do. Personally, I, I wear a, a signet ring uh, of a, not a, a the Blue Lodge as such, uh, but of another order. Uh, it's purely personal choice. It's personal preference. Uh, a number of brethren chose not to wear anything at all. Sometimes you'll see uh, lapel pins or the odd signet ring here and there, but it's, it's not customary, really. Uh, it's, it's purely down personal preference. Right. Okay. But it is, it is common enough that, I mean, you would see Masons wearing rings in public. Yes, yeah, okay. it's, it's something that uh, certainly uh, it's very common. You would see a lot of them. And the more and more you, you visit and visit uh, out with your own province, you'll get to see various styles as well. Uh, but it's something that is, is dying out, unfortunately, is the wearing publicly of tokens or emblems, uh, from what I can see. Okay. Um, 
Brother Walter, uh, do you have a car emblem or do you other, do you typically put an emblem, like a car, a sticker on your car with the square and compass? Or is that no. at all common in Scotland? No. Not it's, at all? Uh, no, not at all. Uh, Scots tend to be, uh, they tend to hide their light under a bushel and uh, keep their Masonic life fairly private. Okay. I think that would be a fair comment. Yes. Uh, Americans, yeah, like, we do both. <laughs> but we'll fare outlandish. Um, uh, Brother Gordon, back to you. Are are your buildings clearly labeled? Like if I was driving along the street, would I see a square and compass on a Masonic yeah. temple? Okay. Yeah, you would see you would see that, and we advertise our meetings in the local papers as well. Uh, yeah. So we, we are quite open in the public in the local community. Okay. Um, so that's all the questions. I really appreciate everybody participating. We had a lot of good discussion and. I learned a lot. Um, is there anything, just to sum up, anything fundamentally different? Those of you who may have experienced more with American Lodges, Brother Cameron probably can weigh in. Anything, what's the biggest difference, if you had to name one, between American-style masonry and Scottish masonry that you've observed? Anything I might not have covered or... I, I, I visited quite a few American lodges over mm -hmm. the, the last 30 years, Chris, I, across a, a variety of states, east to west, north to south. And one of the things I would say is that you have a, a strong family connection as well. You try to involve the families. We do to an extent as well. But I would say that that was a big difference. Okay, very good. Anyone else? Well, I mean, I'm not sure about uh, Virginia, but I know in the Philippines, the the predominantly the installations are open. So the, the wives and families come along to the, 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 the officers being, or see their, their right. spouses, father, or sort of fathers or brothers being installed into their various offices. Right. Uh, again, going back to the, the family thing that uh, Gordon was talking about. But as I say, that's the yeah. Philippines it's, and they take it from California. Oh. We have another brother joining us. Good to see you, brother. <laughs> um, right. we... There is two meters apart, by the way, Brian. Okay. <laughs> um, Rob, Gordon, what's your wallet? <laughs> <laughs> we, um, we're allowed to have open installations. It's not as common as I wish it was, but you're certainly allowed to in Virginia. I wish every lodge would have an open installation. I really do. So the wives can have a chance to attend and see what their husbands are up to, so family members can see. With the dads are up to. <laughs> and I, I see uh, money trading hands. That's a, my, that's a my, my lodge, <laughs> except for the pandemic, my lodge always does open meeting, uh, open installations. And in fact, yes. uh, my particular installation when I was master back in 2011 was uh, I actually had it recorded and put on Facebook. Oh, wow. Um, you can actually see the, the whole thing from there. Yep. Um, I, was, I was blessed to have that. Uh, my brother decided he wanted to do that for me. I, I would say typically, at least in this neck of the woods down in the Hampton Roads area, it's less common. Probably maybe a fourth of the lodges ever have open installations. Yeah, Some have, always have them. Some simply do not. You bring up the yeah. idea and they're like, what? An openness? Why would we want women? In it? Every lodge has its personality. <laughs> I know. That's true. Uh, <laughs> one more um, that I meant to ask. Uh, I'll ask Gordon here. Are you allowed to affiliate with lodges in other grand jurisdictions? Yes, I'm a member of the Internet Lodge uh, English Constitution. Uh, as long as I keep up my dues and them all, that, that's fine. Uh, but there's there's no problem being in multi-jurisdiction uh, as okay. long as it's uh, an amity with uh, your grand lodges. So, uh, for example, uh, a few years ago, uh, the Grand Lodge National Francais and the Grand Lodge of Scotland stopped speaking. And I know, Bern, who are in both lodges, you, you then have to make a decision which grand body you want to stay in good standing with. Ah. Uh, and uh, I would suggest that you stay with your mother lodge because that's Absolutely. where your, your masonry started. Very good. Um, Chris, I'm, Chris I'm, can I can I just ahead. ask that this has just came up recently and it's the lodges. It's not had their first installation yet, but I'm actually going to affiliate to a lodge in England, which is actually a themed lodge. It's actually a Formula One lodge, and that's the name of it. The use have themed lodges in America. Mm -hmm. Themed lodges? No. Like the, the idea behind it, that there's, there's some lodges in England that would be like a rugby lodge, a football lodge. That, that every member. Has the same interest? Do you have that in America? I've heard of that, and no. In America, we do not. The research lodge is the closest to that, but it's Masonic research. It's not 
hobbies or um, thing like right. that. Well, you I, have I some lodges you might call cop lodges because predominantly the members are police, but that's sort of a unofficial <laughs> thing. <laughs> I would love to see it personally if we were to get into that in America and have, you know, a bodies of interest where you had a lodge that only met say four times a year and was specifically oriented around hobbies or what all. I think that might actually get some more interest going because the members well, we do have very... academic lodges. Yeah. What's that? We do have academic lodges. We they're, do. They're, tied, they're tied to different universities. Oh, well, yeah, they're, they're, you have to be a member. Yeah, that's right. You have to be a either a student or an alumni or an employee of that college in order to join the lodge. Yes. But that's you, um, not quite the same thing. The, the, the idea behind it is that they're trying to open Formula One lodges up around the world. So if you go to a race, you can go to a meeting. Oh, that's an um, interesting idea. I like that. Something I'd be very interested in as well. I'd be really interested in that. Is they, a... actually, they actually meet, Gavin. They're, they're, no, they're, they're having an installation in June. They meet, they're going to meet in United Grand Lodge in England, but they're going to have a meeting in uh, February. I think it's February, September. And unfortunately, they're, they're meeting in November classes with my mother lodge installation. But they, they've started it up. Um, if, I'll get some details and I can ping stuff to you, information if, if, if you're interested. But they're going to have, they will meet in United Grand Lodge three times a year, and hopefully that if you go to a race, me and my wife like to try and get a couple of F1 races a year, that's how yeah, I got my, got, got my interest today. Eh? So um, one of the guys is on for Portugal, and he's like, just didn't bother getting a hotel, just come and stay with us. I'm going, have you got a big house? And he went, aye. I went, okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, we've, well. We've got the <laughs> stuff here. Yeah, I'll catch up with you after on that. That'd be great, thank okay. you. Chris, I would like to go ahead and thank all of uh, my Chris, panel. Yeah, go ahead. Can I just say, when you asked about the joining different jurisdictions, yes, I think yes, yes. Cameron, when he was in Hong Kong, would, would back me up on this. All three uh, home constitutions meet in Hong Kong, and most most of the brethren out there are members of the Irish, English, and Scottish constitutions. Ah, interesting. <laughs> And I was a member of an Irish lodge and an honorary member of an English lodge, as well yeah. as my two Scottish lodges. Oh wow, interesting! I went, okay. I went to, I went to Hong Kong for my honeymoon, uh, Cameron, and I actually got, a, got a visit to Eastern Scotia. Ah, yeah. one of the, one of the junior, one of the junior lodges. <laughs> and I, I, I actually I had to. At the time, I had to go, when I went to the meeting, I had to go in between the riot and on the island to get the meeting to get over and get back again. Yeah. I want to go yeah, and actually. thank um, everybody of the panel. Most of you stuck it out to the end, and I appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to go and list everybody. We had uh, all of these brothers. Thank you very much for attending. We had Gordon Mitchie, Scott Watson, Cameron Sloan, Gavin Richardson, David Rintoul, Alan Deegan, Alan Dillett, Kevin Taggart, Robert Clark, Walter Richardson, and Dale Hall. I really appreciate all of you for participating. Uh, if you all want to give any closing thoughts, anybody anything you want to say, it, we've been at it two and a half hours, and it's been great. This will be available on YouTube, hopefully uh, by, the, by the end of the week. Um, but I hope you all come back and attend one of our other unstated meetings. But if you all got anything else to say before we sign off, please go ahead. Yeah, I'd just jump in there and say uh, thank you to yourself for organising this. I've found the discussion really thought-provoking. I've learned an awful lot uh, from the discussion. Uh, some of the uniquenesses and idiosyncrasies. It's been an eye-opener. Thank you. You're very welcome. Indeed. Thank you very much, uh, Chris. And thank Chris, you, thank you for your um, circulars and the uh, research papers. Oh, glad you enjoyed them. I think one thing that's come out this COVID pandemic is bringing us as Bern particularly interested in research together. And it's great to see so many Bern uh, from research lodges around the world here. And again, I would echo what Cameron said about uh, your weekly paper. It is uh, of great interest to uh, the members of Lodge Hope Karachi every week. We, we do share it with them. And it's just a, a great pleasure that we've been able to continue that daily advancement in Masonic knowledge through the, the virtual means of Zoom. Uh, during this uh, terrible time. Thank you. And anybody who's not on the mailing list, please, I saw my, I posted my email in the chat earlier, but please um, uh, message me if you'd like to sign up. Chris, thanks, very very much. Chris thanks very much for the invite this afternoon. It was great to be with 
with you guys and having a discussion. Uh, and if you don't mind, I've got another Zoom meeting at seven o'clock, so I've got to go and get some refreshments because it's a quiz. <laughs> And uh, me, and my wife, me and my wife are usually very rubbish at it. So uh, I, hope he's all, I hope he's all take care and we can meet up again soon. Thank you. Thanks, yeah, everyone. Take care, everyone. Right. Yeah, right, Chris, great. thanks very much for this afternoon. Yes, uh, absolutely be along again. All right. All right. Thank you again for everybody for participating. And uh, we'll see you all soon.